a service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Tender Ray Beef, no other beef so fresh can be so tender, presents Hearts in Harmony Transcribed. Have you had this experience? Many times when you've opened the door of the refrigerator, you've glanced inside hoping to see a thick, juicy Kroger Tender Ray Beef steak. Sure, it's happened to you, for you'd like nothing better than to treat your family to fresh-tasting, tender, and juicy Kroger Tenderay beef. But say, we hope that one of these days soon, you won't have reason to feel like Mother Hubbard each time you approach the refrigerator. Yes, there's a mighty good chance that in the near future, you'll be able to get fresh and tender Kroger Tenderay beef. Right now, however, those famous steaks and roasts are scarce because top grades of grain-fattened cattle are difficult to obtain. And that's the reason for the scarcity. Kroger uses only the very top grades of grain-fattened cattle for Kroger Tenderay beef. And then it's made naturally tender in just three days by the famous Kroger Tenderay method. It's always fresh, because through Kroger's own Tenderay method, there's no need for wasteful aging or loss of rich natural juices. Remember, no other beef so fresh can be so tender. And remember, too, until Kroger Tenderay beef is plentiful again, Kroger will always bring you the very best beef on the market whenever it's available. And now, Hearts in Harmony. The almost impossible has happened. Penny's pleas for Freddie Lang have been successful. He's been found guilty as charged by the New York police. But through Penny's efforts, he was given a suspended sentence and allowed to return to Rossville with Professor Rogers, his uncle. It is the next day now, and in Rossville, Penny is telling Jeb the good news. Oh, Jeb, it's almost too good to believe, isn't it? To tell you frankly, Penny, it's something I don't want to believe. Why don't you want to believe it? Because I just don't want to, that's all. I thought you were getting rid of that boy. You mean you hoped he'd go to jail? No, no, of course not. Wouldn't even think of such a thing. But I was hoping he'd stay in New York, or Professor Rogers would send him somewhere else, anything to keep him away from you. And why should he be kept away from me? He isn't... Well, he just isn't good for you, child, that's why. Why... Why, he's not even any good to himself. He's bad, Penny, bad all the way through. Is he? You know he is. He lied to you about being guilty of all those things the New York police wanted him for, didn't he? Yes, but I can see why he did. And I can see why he did, too. He's the sort of fellow who doesn't know the meaning of truth. And people who aren't acquainted with truth aren't acquainted with the qualities that make for decency and all the other things it takes to get along in a society of human beings. Oh, Jed, I love you very much and respect you as much as I love you. But you're so wrong sometimes. Sure I am. I'm wrong a lot of times. But I'm not wrong about this Freddie Lang. Didn't the New York police prove that Freddie did all the things they accused him of? Yes. Didn't he finally have to admit he did them? Yes, he did. And then didn't the judge find him guilty and sentence him to a nice healthy spell behind bars? Yes, Jed, all those things are true. But the judge suspended sentence on Freddie, didn't he? Sure, sure he did. And why? Because two honest, decent, respectable, and respected citizens stood up for Freddy and promised that he'd behave himself from now on. It was the worst thing, child. You know why? I most certainly don't. Well, I most certainly do. He got out of this scrape pretty easily, didn't he? Wasn't any trouble at all. He robbed, destroyed property, and a few other things that honest people don't do. And he's virtually forgiven for everything just because he managed to meet you and be a nephew to Professor Rogers. He must be chuckling to himself right now. 
chuckling over what? Over the fact that crime is easy, and getting out of paying for your crimes is even easier. You mean to say that you think you'll start out now and... Maybe launch a real man-sized life of crime. Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Well, I certainly don't agree with you. And I won't believe that Freddy's inherently dishonest. Nor will I believe that he'll take advantage of a friendship, nor do I think he's so stupid as to feel that he can even so much as steal an apple and get away with it again. Oh, Jed, no. I, I really think that Freddy's learned his lesson. I think it's about time we learned the lesson, too. What lesson do we have to learn? The lesson that because someone's gone off the beaten and accepted tract at one time, that that person will go off again. Oh, Jed, you've made mistakes, so have I, many of them, but we don't condemn each other for them, do we? Our mistakes and crimes aren't things that can be compared. Well, Freddie's crime was just a simple, honest mistake of a boy acting without thinking. I won't believe it. I say the boy has the makings of a hardened criminal. Well, of course he'll be a hardened criminal if he ever hears you talk like that. Well, he's not going to hear me, because I'm not ever going to see him if I can help it. Then I guess I shouldn't have brought him up to your office. You brought that ruffian up here? Where is he? In your outer office, waiting. Waiting for what? To see you. To see... About what? About a job. A job? Why, I wouldn't recommend that boy... I'm not asking you to recommend him to anyone. I'm asking you to give him a job yourself. Give him a job? I don't have an office at the North Pole, and that's as near as I'd let that boy get to me in any business of mine. But yet he has to have a job. Well, he won't get one here or anywhere in Rossville either. Nobody will have him. No one but you. You're going to give him a job. I am not. Oh, yes, you are. It's a favor to me. But really, it's a service to Freddie. It's part of the terms of the suspension to Freddie's sentence. Oh, Jetty has to go to work. Well, then tell him to go somewhere else and go to work. Up at Wayne City or Rainville. Well, we'll be able to keep a, a, a better eye on him if he works right here. Look, you've never met him, have you? No, and I don't want to. Well, you see, all applicants for jobs, you told me so yourself. Now, Freddie Lang is applying for a job, so you have to see him. Uh, Penny, I, I ought to take you over my... Freddie. Yeah, Gibbsy. I can't see the big boss now, huh? Yep, Mr. Williams will see you right now. Uh... Oh, that's good, Gibbsy. Thanks a lot. You know, you're a pretty dame. was a pretty good string puller, too. Freddie, Betty. <laughs> Behave. What have I done that's wrong now? Nothing, Freddie, nothing. Uh, Jed, this is Freddie Lang. Freddie, this is Mr. Billings. Uh... Hi, Mac. Well, when do I start? What's the rake off? How few hours can I get away with? Can I start with two weeks vacation? And how soon are you going to cut me in on a piece of this here now business? And how soon can you get out of that door and out on the street, Mr. Lang? Right away, Mac. And thanks for the offer to job. But I think I'd rather stay in retirement this season. Come on, Gibbsy. Freddie Lang, you stay right where you are. Come on, will you, Gibbsy? This guy don't want me, and I don't want his job either. I don't blame him if he doesn't want you now. But I do know that you want a job and need a job. First of all, stop being a fool and apologize to Jed. And secondly, ask him politely for the job. Why waste a man's time, Gibbsy? My daughter's name is Miss Gibbs, young man. Yeah, I know that, Mac. But I call her Gibbsy. And you know why? That's because I like her, see? And when I like people, I got names for them that other people don't have. Come on, Gibbsy. Let's get going. We're just wasting this man's time. Freddie, I... I'm so ashamed of you, I could cry. What for, Gibbsy? You know very well what for. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay. But, come on, let's not talk about it here. No. No, we'll talk about that job here. Look, do you have to make me say it, Gibbsy? You think I don't feel low enough making you pave the way for me so I can get into a guy's office and ask him for a job? Do I have to stand here and listen to a guy give me a job when all the time I know he hates me and he thinks that I'm some low cheek crook and maybe I'm going to steal his back teeth if he ever opens his mouth? Do you think I want everything I get to be a handout? I came up here because you asked me to come up here. You've done okay by me, and the least I can do is do what you asked me to do, whether I like it or not. Sure. I want a job here. i got to have a job somewheres. Mr. Billings, he looks like a pretty good okay guy, but... Well, at least he's okay enough for an old count jerk like me. But look, Gibbsy... That's Gipsy. enough, Freddy. I think you've explained yourself very thoroughly. Now, do me a favor, will you? Whether you like it or not, ask Jed for that job. Do I gotta? As a favor to me, if you will. Well, okay, Gibbsy, but it won't do no good. Mr. Billings. Yes, son? Ah... Uh, I'm looking for a job. 
I gotta have a job, and I'll do anything for almost anything you can spare in the way of dough. You can put the light touch to the petty cash for my fare if that's all you can do. It'd be okay with me. Ah, uh, you see, I need the job on account I was a dope and got into a jam with some cops, and if I don't get a job and show those cops that I'm on a level, I'm gonna be busting rocks for a living. I ain't got much of a rep for being an honest guy, but... Well, I'd like to build one up. I'd sure appreciate it if you'd give me the job. And, well, I... I guess that's it. You're quite sure that's all? Yeah, that's all. And thanks very much for the waste of your time. I'll scram. Yes, uh, scram, son. But see me here in my office at 9 tomorrow morning and be prompt. People who work for me have to be on time. Grace. Oh, Grace, I'm home. Oh, home so soon, Jack. <laughs> well, not home any sooner tonight than usual. It's after six. Why, it is a sad, isn't it? Where does the time go? Well, where do we go for dinner tonight? I'd like you not to know what time it is by how long the roast has been in the oven. Well, we're eating at the Baldwin's tonight. Don't you remember, dear? That's why I lost track of the time. I wasn't cooking today. Just reading and enjoying not being a housewife for a change. <laughs> you know you love it. Being a housewife or not being one? <laughs> Both. Say, but you sure are dressed up. <laughs> Thank you, dear. And I'd better be able to say the same thing about you in a half hour. We have to hurry. Oh, I'll be ready in ten minutes. Uh, oh, say, got some news for you. News? Good. What is it? I had a new man for the office today. Oh, you did? Who? Freddie Lang. Freddie Lang. Yep. That young scamp nephew of Professor Rogers. Uh, he's young, all right. And he's a thief, Jed. How can you hire a man like that? Oh, why, very easily. You're tiring. Jed Billings, you're not going to have that boy in your office. Why, that, that's the most stupid thing that I've ever... I know what I'm doing, Grace. Oh, you do, do you? Well, you know what you're going to do tomorrow, too, I hope. Sure. Get the boy started on the job. You are not. You're getting rid of him. Penny's forced to keep him in her home for a little while, I know that. And that's bad enough. But you don't have to give him a job, and you're not going to. No? Well, I already have. You've as good as fired him, too, do you understand? Jed Billings, you do as I say. And what if I don't? Well, if you don't, you'll have trouble from him. But that isn't all. You'll have trouble from me, too. <laughs> going to be trouble in the Billings home because Jed has given Freddie a job. Is Penny going to be the cause of strife in her mother's life just because she wants to help a lost and wayward boy? Be sure to listen to the next dramatic episode of Hearts in Harmony. You know, soon your days of waiting for the return of fresh and tender Kroger Tender Ray beef will be over. For it's expected that in the near future, famous Kroger Tenderay beef will be plentiful once more. But until that time, don't forget this. Kroger will always bring you the very best beef on the market whenever it's available. And remember, too, your neighborhood Kroger store has a grand selection of fine meats, seafoods with an ocean-fresh flavor, and tempting country-tasting poultry. And all are priced for real economy. So for the finest in foods, go to your neighborhood Kroger store. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the 
far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of Astounding Science Fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, The Castaways, by Ernest Kinoy. In the South Pacific, night comes on rapidly. The sun dips below the flat horizon, the sea is crimson for a moment, and then night falls. But on Tahani Atoll, giant arc lights turn night into day. Across the waters of the lagoon, within the barrier reef, launches and tugs skitter back and forth. While on the curving half-moon of the island, army trucks and jeeps scuttle down the rough roads bulldozed by the sea bees just six weeks ago. A low Quonset hut stands near the beach, surrounded by tangled wire. This is the preliminary command post. And inside is General Frank Gadosh, field director of the test. Operation Destruction. Everything's on schedule, General. Radiological surveys complete. Instruments placement checked. Well, get me Navy and tell them each hour is as ordered. Send a periodic time check to Air Force on 90 week talk. An observation control on the Missouri. Yes, sir. I want a complete roster check on all personnel before each hour. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Nate Cohen wants to see you. Well, who the devil's he? AP man. He's been selected by the press radio pool to interview. I haven't got any time. Tell him to speak to Major Dwight Breedenberg. He's the PRO. I think perhaps you'd better see him, sir. The uh, the directive on public relations from Washington was very clear. Well, how in places am I supposed to run a bomb test and play mother hand to a bunch of reporters? Washington said... That... All right, all right. Bring him in. Borelli? Yes, sir. Give me some black coffee, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Mr. Cohen, uh, General Gator. How do you do, General? Lousy, as a matter of fact. Is that an official statement? No. You can run some of that. The world is at the crossroads, baloney. I wrote that yesterday. General, what effect do you think the new bomb will have on the world situation? I can't tell you that, even if I knew. My job is to set the blasted thing off and see that nobody gets hurt and collect the data. Can I speak to you a moment, sir? Later, Alan. Go ahead, Cohen. Can you release anything on the scientific principles involved? I don't even understand it myself. There... Wait a minute. Dr. Muller? Yes? Come over here a minute, will you? Cohen, this is Dr. Fred Muller, civilian scientific director. He's the only one who knows what's inside that warhead. How do you do, Mr. Cohen? How about a statement, Doctor? Oh, I'm afraid all I'm allowed to say is that the bomb is new, it's extremely powerful, and off the record, it's very tricky and dangerous. What'll happen if it goes off prematurely? I don't think we have to worry about that. In fact, we wouldn't even know about it. If you'll excuse me. How about the natives? Well, what about them? Aren't they going to be evacuated from the island? We already have been. General Gator. Well, I, I saw the Tahani chief outside when I came in. The whole tribe squatting down at the motor pool, having a conference. What? Alan, I've been trying to tell you, sir, the, the Tahani are still on the island. Well, why? The LCTs are ready, aren't they? Hey, yes, sir, but uh, they won't go. They refuse. The schedule called for their evacuation to Bailani three hours ago. I realize that, sir, but I hoped we could still get them off without violence. Look, Alan, they're either on the island or off. Now, wait a minute. Cohen, that's all. What are you going to do about the natives, General? Never mind. I'll issue a statement later. You're going to force them? Go on. Get out. I haven't got time. All right, General. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right, Alan. Let's have it. Well, sir, that honey been kicking up all along. They won't leave. They won't. Do they know what's going to happen to the island? Do they know that we're going to blow it higher than a kite? I told the chief. He, he just said they won't go. They'll go, all right, if I have to... Yeah. Hey, get him in here. The chief? Yeah. And that, that lieutenant who interprets. Yes. How do you like that, Dr. Muller? I haven't got enough trouble. You know, I feel rather sorry for the Tahani. Can't make much sense to them. We arrive and tell them they've got to get out. Look, I appreciate your finer feelings, Muller, but I can't let the Kanakas hold up the bomb test. They're not Kanakas, General. Captain Cook discovered the island in 1788. Well, what's the difference? Lieutenant Gilbert reporting, sir. Aloha, Kalahiri, Hey, look, I haven't got time for ceremony, Gilbert. Tell the chief he and his tribe have got to get off the island. We're providing homes for them on Mailani. Translate, Gilbert. The chief says you do not understand. Mailani is a bad island. 
My people have lived on Tahani from the time that our ancestors were cast away on the island. The spirits of our ancestors are buried in the earth. Our fathers are buried here. Our fathers' fathers. If he thinks I'm going to move his graveyard, he's crazy. In our ancestors' time, the Tehani came in a great bird canoe. We were cast away on this island. We have made it our home. What right have you now to carry us over the sea to a strange land where we would die weeping for our homes? We will not go. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. Well, thank you, Dr. Muller. You're a great help. Say, Gilbert. Yes, sir. Tell him I have no choice. He's got till midnight to get his tribe on board those LCTs peacefully, or I'll have the Marine Detachment carry him aboard. Yes, sir. Isn't that rather harsh, General? After all, justice is on their side. We're preparing to blow up their island, and we haven't asked them about it. Dr. Muller, will you kindly confine yourself to the scientific aspects of this operation? I'll take care of administrative matters. If you could explain to them what's at stake here. Any further explaining I've got to do, I'll do with the Marine detachments. I'm not going to hold up my schedule. Well, Gilbert? I, I told him, sir. All right, get him out of here. I've had enough. Oh, no, no, Koala. What the devil's that? Some kind of a curse, sir. I can catch some of it. The island will remember the tears of its children and punish the invaders. The great destroyers will not destroy. And the evil man who is the chief will travel far through the blackness of night. Even as the children of the island end, so will he. All right, Gilbert, take him away. You in here, sir. Colonel Allen, get a detail from the Marine Detachment with tear gas and small arms down to the motor pool. And in one hour, have those natives on that transport, and I don't care how they do it. Is that my copy, Varelli? Yes, sir. They must know about the bomb. The great destroyer will not destroy. You worried about that curse? I should think you might be. He threatened you personally. If I were you, I'd carry a pistol till they got off the island. The chief looked as if he'd cheerfully strangle you with his bare hands. I'm supposed to end the way they do. What's that? Probably the Tahani saying goodbye to their island. I think I'll go down to the motor pool. Well, stay out of the way. And get back here in an hour. We've got to have this wrapped up and headquarters moved out to the Missouri by dawn. Instrument room checking in, sir. That's the last. Have the Missouri take over control and send for my jeep. Yes, sir. Are the LCT standing by for those natives? Yes, sir. They're on the beach. The bomb unit is assembled in place, General. 2330, right on the nose. Robin, start evacuation procedure. But the honey, you've stuck. Allen's probably moving him out to the beach. Check in with Navy and Air Force, Borelli. Yes, sir. What's that? Coming to the beach. It's the honey making trouble. Come on. General. Hey, you, Gilbert, what is it? Colonel Allen ordered the Marines. Well, what happened? The natives just got up and started marching. Did they embark? You don't understand, sir. They marched up the cliff and right off into the lagoon. What? All of them. The women and the kids, too. They didn't even try to swim. What were you doing all this time? Just standing around with your thumb in your mouth? Where was the Marine detachment? We couldn't stop them, sir. They just walked over the cliff. They didn't even scream. Not even the kids. We sent the crash boats out, but we couldn't get them any of them. The crazy idiots. Were there any reporters there? Well, Cohen and a life photographer. Well, get his film and hold it till I release it. What are you going to do, General? Postpone H hour? It's too late for that now. And calling H hour off isn't going to bring the natives back. One hundred men, women, and children just walking into the water. It's, it's horrible. I know. I'm not happy about it either. There's nothing we can do now. I gave him a chance to get off. I was just thinking about the curse the chief put on you. Even as the children of the island end, so will he... That's what he said to you, General. I know, I heard him. Your jeep's waiting, General. The great destroyer will not destroy. That must mean the bomb. Don't worry, Dr. Muller. It'll take more than a mumbo-jumbo curse from a native witch doctor to stop this operation. At each hour, that bomb goes off. Hour minus one minute thirty seconds. H minus one thirty. Video screen's hooked in, sir. All right, check control stations. Observation station one. Observation station one, check. Radiation station. Radiation control, check. Test the firing circuit, Dr. Muller. Right, General. Two, check. 
Damage control station. Damage control station. All set. Communications. Communications, sir. All check in, sir. It is H minus one minute. H minus one. Take a good look at that island on that screen, Dr. Muller. When you throw that key, it just won't be there anymore. Nothing but an atom mushroom over the lagoon. Quite a funeral fire for the Tahunis. Stubborn idiots. They can't get in the way of progress. Progress? I wonder if it is, General. It is H minus 30 seconds. H hour minus 29, 28, 27, 26. The Great Destroyer. That's what he called the bomb. Hold it, Muller. Allen, report. All checked in, sir. Camera's running. Sound fire warning. Stand by for firing. Ready, Muller? Ready. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Fire! General, it didn't go off. The bomb didn't go off. Borelli, signal standby, condition red. Yes, sir. Allen, check readings. Muller, what's wrong? What happened? I don't know. The bomb didn't go off. Well, what do you mean? Why didn't it? I don't know, except for one thing. The Tahani chief said the great destroyer would not destroy. It didn't, General. The bomb didn't go off. What about it, General? What happened? Have you got a statement? Nothing you can use, Cohen. Not till we find out what went wrong. Hey, who let you come aboard this ship? I walked on. You don't know why the bomb failed? It didn't fail. It just didn't go off. What's that tank thing on the deck, General? Undersea salvage unit, Mark IV. They call it a bottom crawler. Somebody gone down? Well, that bomb is down there in the lagoon somewhere. Could go off at any second. Somebody's got to go down and find it and disarm it. That's a lovely job. Who's elected? I am. Wow. And Dr. Muller. He's the only one who knows how to dismantle it. All is ready, General. All right. Come on, Muller. I'm ready. Alan, as soon as we hit shallow water, get those gates open. We'll pull the crawler out. And then you get away in a hurry. If that bomb goes while we're working on it, I don't want any casualties. Yes, sir. Inside, Muller. All right. I'm in. Now, remember, get this LST out of the lagoon in a hurry. You got that, Alan? You take your orders from Admiral Yancey. Yes, sir. Good luck. Closing the hatch. The radar and Geiger counter warmed up, Muller. I was just thinking of something, General. That curse, part of it came true. The bomb didn't go off. Well? The second part of that curse was that you would end where they ended. That was at the bottom of the lagoon. What are you trying to do, Muller? Nothing. I was just thinking this crawler is going to take us right down there where the Tahani died. I'm not worried about a handful of dead natives, Muller. I'm worried about that bomb. Okay, they're opening the gate. Let's go. USU-4 to control. Depth 50 feet, bottom sandy, dropping off sharp. Anything on sonar, Muller? School of fish. Uh-huh. You ever been down in a crawler before? Only in the tank at New London. I think I've got a Geiger reading dead ahead. Hang on. Getting something on sonar now. Left to point. USU-4 to control. Over. USU-4 to control. Over. Note the radio's out. Dead ahead. Looks too large to be the bomb. Can't see much on the forward vision plate. Hey, wait a minute. That's part of the reef ahead. That's where the guy in the reading indicated. The bomb must have settled in a hole in the reef. We'll have to go after it in diving suits. The suits are in the locker. Let's get this over with. The less time I spend down here waiting for that bomb to blow, the better I like it. Your helmet clamped tight. You getting me all right on your headset? Okay. I'm going to fill the lock. Here goes the outer door. Let's go. This is 
like that diving tank in New London. Look out for that coral. It can cut you to ribbons. There's a hole of some sort there. Where till I get the light up? See if we can get a Geiger reading out of that hole. Just a... There. It's down there, all right. Careful. I'll drop down first. See anything down there? Muller, get down here fast. What is it? Find something? The bottom of this hole is... It's metal and the sides. But, but it's the coral reef. Look, well, the joints. These are hull plates of some kind. And... Look out, above us. It's closing. Grab it. Too late. A metal hatch. It just slid over the top. This is impossible. What's going on? It's like an airlock. The water's being pumped out. General, you realize what this means? I'm not sure. There's an inner door opening. Careful. What do we do now? There isn't much we can do. We can take off our helmets, though. The dial shows good air. <clears throat> All right. Come on. What is this? An undersea fort? What's it doing here? What does it mean? Whatever it is, our bomb must be down here. Wait. There's someone there. I, I can't see. There's, there's a shadow. Who is it? Who's there? Welcome, Dr. Muller. Welcome to our ship. We've been waiting for you. General, it can't be. Do you see it? It's the Tahani Chi. How long has the bottom crawler been down, Borelli? Four hours, sir. Two since we lost contact. Now, keep trying. Yes, sir. I've given him enough time. I'm going to send another crawler down. What do you figure happened to him, Colonel? Well, there are a lot of things. Hey, how did you get in here? I walked in. When are you going to release this, Colonel? It's the biggest story since the election. Bomb are dead and Dr. Muller and General Gaydash dead. They're not dead. At least we don't know they are. As long as that bomb doesn't go off, there's still a chance. What happened? Come on. Charlie, condition red. Gilbert, radiation control into action. Get the hot squad into Tahani Lagoon as soon as it's cleared. And get me a PT boat with radiation screen. What is it, Colonel? What happened? The bomb must have blown. How about Muller and the general? If they were down there in that lagoon, you guess. Now get out of my way. I'm busy. Radiation reading 75 and steady. Take her in as close to the beach as you can. Steady as she goes. Is there any danger of any more explosions? No. When she goes, she goes. Radiation 82. That's still safe. Cohen, is that something on the beach? Yeah. Looks like a body. Maybe you blew one of the Tahani back out of the lagoon. No, no. It's moving. Gilbert, glasses. Yes, sir. It's a man, all right. Head into the beach. Who is it, Colonel? Can't tell. He's in a diving suit. It's either Muller or General Gaydar. <laughs> Get his helmet off. Easy now. Twist to the right. There. It, it's Muller. Uh, Gilbert, help me get him out of this diving suit. We've got to get him to the medics. No radiation burns. Superficial bruises, mild shock. He'll be all right, Colonel. Can he talk? For a while. Uh, bomb go off. It didn't. He's still out of his head. Quiet, Cohen. Go on, Dr. Muller. What did you find? A ship. A giant metal ship there under the lagoon. A submarine? No, no. It was a spaceship. Spaceship? Space? Camouflaged right next to the reef. When, when we went inside, we found the Tahani chief and all the tribe. Alive. What? They drowned in the lagoon. I saw them. No, they didn't commit suicide as we thought. They just dived underwater into the rocket airlock. Rocket? Airlocks? Now, look, Mother, I know you've suffered a shock, but... But it's true. It can't be. A spaceship built by Polynesian savages. But they're not savages. They're the castaways. They're from another planet. Don't you understand? Their spaceship was wrecked here 400 years ago. They've been waiting ever since for a chance to go home. He's out of his mind. Better give him a sedative, Doctor. No, 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 wait a minute, Colonel. 
Remember their story about the great bird canoe? Maybe there's something to the legend. Not the legend, it's true. They'd exhausted their fuel, came down out of space, couldn't find anything here on Earth to replace their fuel source until we developed atomic power. Atomic power? You mean they stole our bomb? That's right. Fished it out of the lagoon, hauled it aboard. Yes, but how could they convert it to atomic drive? They made me dismantle it for them at the point of a gun. Then just before they blasted off, they let me go. But what about the general? Remember the Tahani curse? I see. You mean they killed him? You don't understand. I said I dismantled that bomb at the point of a gun. It was General Gaydash who was holding the gun. What? He was one of them, one of their spies sent out to bring back the rocket fuel they needed. And the Tahani curse wasn't a curse at all. It said that when they left the island, so would he. You mean he's with them now? Yes. And after 400 years, the castaways are going home. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. Horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one. Tonight, the Ray Bradbury story entitled, And the Moon Be Still as Bright. The first three expeditions from Mars left Earth in a mushroom of flame, arced through the atmosphere, and finally dwindled to tiny specks in the big eye of the Mount Palomar telescope, and then were lost to sight forever. The prearranged landing signals flashed back to Earth, and then the radios went dead. One after the other, ships had disappeared and were never heard from again. But still, the rockets came. The fourth expedition emerged from the silent gulfs of space, angled down toward the floating red disk of Mars, down into an orbit as the order came to land. The last blast of the bow jets broke red against the blue desert sands and the ship slid to a halt at the edge of a vast city that reflected the icy glare of the moonlight. For a while, all was still. All right, Park Hill. Open the airlock. Hi, sir. Fresh air. Hey, it's cold out here. Who cares? We got here. I thought I'd never hit solid ground again. Hey, how about a fire, Captain Wildy? It's freezing. Later. We have work to do. Oh, smell that air. Why, you could get drunk on it. Say, there's an idea. Why don't we break out a bottle and celebrate? Biggs, there will be no drinking done till we're secured. But we're landed, Captain. Three other expeditions landed and disappeared within 24 hours. Now, we're not relaxing security till we find out what happened to them. What do you mean? Maybe Martians? Sender. 
You're an archaeologist. How old would you say they are? I can't tell till I study them more closely. It's the kind of engineering we couldn't duplicate on Earth. Well, I'm not interested in the architecture now. I want to make sure there's nothing there that might be dangerous. Mr. Hathaway. Yes, sir? I want you and Spender to take a reconnaissance party into the city and find out what's there. We set up camp here. No man is to go more than 50 feet from this rocket. And there'll be no celebration till Hathaway and his party report back. In the sea bottoms, the wind stirred along faint vapors. And from the mountains, great stone visages looked upon the silvery rocket and the small fire. The sky was black overhead as the two racing moons threw knife-edged double shadows on the desert. All right, come and get it. Ciao. Hey, what do you got there, Jackie? Sort of smothered in cold chicken fat. Good, I thought it was something I couldn't eat. <laughs> Hey, Captain! Mr. Hathaway's back. Oh, Captain. Captain Wilder. Oh, yes, over here, Mr. Hathaway. Well, most of the city's dead. Spender says it's been dead a good many thousand years, but we found one part about a mile over... What about it? People were living in it last week, sir. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. We found bodies, thousands of bodies. They hadn't been dead more than ten days. When did they die? You won't believe it. What killed them? Chicken pox. Chicken pox? Yes. Where could they get chicken pox? From Earth. Oh, then the other rockets did get through. Yes. I don't know what the Martians did to them, but I sure know what they did to the Martians. They gave them chicken pox and wiped them out. They just didn't have any resistance to an Earth disease. Now think of it, Captain. A race builds itself for a million years, refines itself, does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty, and then it dies. Of what? It's like saying the Greeks died of mumps or the proud Roman Empire collapsed because of athlete's foot. We didn't even give them a decent excuse for dying. We just gave them chicken pox. Spender, get hold of yourself. You didn't see those bodies, Captain. Yes, I know. It must have been a shock. You need a rest, a little relaxation. The Martians are dead. There's nothing you can do about that now. Hey, you hear that? The Martians are all dead. Come on, let's break out a bottle and hoop it out. How about a case, eh? Oh, good Lord. They have to do that now. Isn't there time later to throw old beer cans into the canals? Bender, you're an idealist. They're not. All they know now is that they're safe. A little shouting won't hurt. You think too much. I was safe on Mars. The first Earth men on Mars. We got to celebrate. <laughs> Twenty bottles were opened and drunk. The voices got louder. The earth laughs and shouts echoing across the empty Martian sands. Spender listened to the wind over his ears, cool and whispering. He felt the land getting cooler. The stars drew closer, very near. The air smelled clean and new. He looked at the cool ice of the white Martian buildings over there on the empty sea lands. <laughs> Hey, what do we do with these empty bottles? Save them, stupid. There's a two cents deposit. Ah! <laughs> Throw them away. Hey, wait, wait. How about that building? Two to one on a buck, I can heave one right through that window. You're on. Ah, here it goes. Hey! Oh, God. Hey, double it up for the next shot. Put that bottle down, Biggs. Who's there, Mr. Spender? Stop smashing those windows. What's the difference? The planet's ours now. I guess I can do anything with it I want. Drop that bottle or I'll knock your teeth out. Yeah? Hey, just watch me. I warned you. Big. Hey, 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 come on, come on. Get on. Hey, what's going on here? Spender! Spender! I hit him. He's crazy, Captain. He just walked up and slugged me. All right, thanks. Spender, you come with me. Now, suppose you explain. What was the idea? The noise, the drunken brawl. And the men are tired. This has been a long trip. And you have a different way of seeing things. Oh, I'm seeing things, all right. I'm seeing how we'll ruin Mars. We'll rip it up and rip the skin off the way we've already ruined Earth. Is that why you hit Biggs? Yes. I couldn't stand the idea of 
Them watching us make fools of ourselves. Them? The Martians. They're dead. They're all dead. But they know we're here. Doesn't an old thing always know when a new thing comes? We've come a long way to smash their windows and spit in their wine. Well, maybe you're right. But I'm still going to fine you $50 for that fight. Now, come on, Spender. Suck in your chin. We'll go back there and play happy. Now they moved out into the moonlight across the desert. They made their way into the dreamy, dead city. The light of the racing twin moons glinted on the barrel of a pistol, the long blade of a machete, the round, gurgling shape of a raised bottle. The wind blew in from the dead sea bottom and brushed through the silvery wire filigree of the towers. Strange music drifted down to the double shadowed streets, a thin, haunted music that played as it had played through the uncounted years of time. Nobody moved. The moons held and froze them. The wind beat slowly around them. Kids, I just want to make a little noise. What kind of a celebration is this, anyway? Come on. They built this city thousands of years ago. And now where are they? How did they die? Who cares? They're dead. That's good enough for me. Lord Byron. What? Lord Byron, a 19th century poet. He wrote a poem that fits this city. Might have been written by the last Martian poet. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving, though the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul outwears its breast. And the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself must rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon. Yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. Without a word, the Earthmen stood in the center of the city. It was a clear night. There was not a sound except the music of the wind. At their feet lay a tile court, worked into the shapes of ancient animals and images. They stood there, silvered by the double moons beneath the crystal towers of Mars. And then Biggs was sick, and the sour stench of liquor filled the cool air. The men of Earth had come to Mars. And Spender turned and walked away into the city, alone in the moonlight, never once stopping to look back. It was a morning that might have been a Monday, or a Tuesday, or any day on Mars. Biggs was on the canal rim, his feet hung down in the cool water, soaking, while he took the sun in his face. Hey, what are you doing back here, Biggs? Didn't you go out with the search party? Yeah. I come back. I got a blister. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? Look. Look, Cherokee. See that? Well, anyway, I had enough searching. Four days hunting for that screwball spender. Didn't find him yet, huh? No, oh, good riddance. Oh, my feet. I'm going to soak them in the canal. Uh, if I was wilder, I wouldn't worry about that nut spender. Let him go. He's a cracked pot anyway. Well, he's a little foggy upstairs, I guess. Hey, why don't you take your feet out of that canal, Biggs? I got to make coffee out of that water. Coffee? You call that stuff coffee? I had a motorcycle once that dripped grease that tasted better than... Wait a minute, Biggs. Hey, hey, look over there. Where? By that bush. There's someone there. Hey. It's him. Hey. Hey, Spender. Spender? He's coming over. Why don't he stay lost, that crazy jerk? Hi, Spender. Long time no see. Hello, Cherokee. I have been exploring some ruins. Oh, you and them ruins. You're like a dog in a boneyard. What's the matter? Why don't you say something? Where you been? Up in the hills. What would you say if I told you I found a Martian? Oh, yeah? Where? Never mind. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you were a Martian and people came to your land and started to tear it up? Well, I know how I feel. I've, I've got Cherokee blood in me. My grandfather told me a lot of things about the way they kicked the Indians around in the Oklahoma Territory. 
If there's any Martian around, I'm all for him. How about you, Biggs? They're dead. They're all dead. It's a good thing, too. Well, I found a Martian. Up in a dead town in the hills. I've been reading their books, and they're easy to understand. And I've learned their language. And then I found this Martian. And I brought him here, now. I don't see no Martian. I'm the last Martian. What did you say? Biggs, I'm going to kill you. Oh, cut it out. What kind of a lousy joke is that? And I don't... Now, don't. Put that gun away. <laughs> you're kidding, huh? Now, Spender, you're... Ah! Ah! He's dead. You killed him. You can come with me, Cherokee. You're an Indian. You know how the Martians would feel. You can be with me in this. You killed him. You just... You just killed him. He deserved it. You're crazy. Maybe I am. But you can come with me. Come with you? For what? Go on, get out of here, you crazy murderer. Of all of them, I thought you'd understand. I thought you'd remember what happened to your own people. You get out of here, you crazy murdering... Don't reach for the gun. Spender. Spender. Hathaway, break out the arms locker. Issue pistols, rifles, and grenades. Yes, sir. And you'd better get the Bible out of the navigation chest. We have to bury these two. Now, partly you start digging a grave, hmm? How about Spender? We'll have to go up in the hills and find him. Just let me at him with my bare hands, a crazy murdering louse. That's enough, Park Hill. The man is sick. He must be... Sick my eye, he's... That's a... enough. Now grab a shovel and start digging. <laughs> Spender saw the thin dust rising in the valley, and he knew the pursuit was beginning. The sun burned farther up the sky, and the blue sand drifted lazily across the sea bottom below. He sat beside a quiet pool 10,000 years old and held the silver book. Through the house played the strange wind music of ancient Mars, and he heard voices whisper in his mind. <laughs> I hear you. I've always heard you. Even down there on Earth. No, I won't run. What's the use? Live, Earthman. Live, live, live. Live, what for? To see them tear down your temples and put up hot dog stands? Run, 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 run. They've seen me now. They know I'm up here. They're wilder now. I've got him right in my sights. Kill, 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 kill. Funny, he hasn't ordered them to use grenades. They could lob one right up here and blow me to bits. Yeah, maybe the captain thinks I'm too nice to be blown to bits. He wants my death to be clean. Just one bullet hole in me, nothing messy. And why? Because he understands me. Kill, 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 the only one in the crew who ever did. Kill, 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 well, at least I can do the same for him. Just one bullet in his head, a nice, clean death. All I have to do is pull the trigger and then... It's no use. I can't do it to him. Spender! Spender! Can you hear me, Spender? I hear you, Captain. What do you want? Talk! Bruce! All right. Come on up. Leave your gun down there and keep your hands up. Oh. That's quite a climb. You would mind if I sit down? Hmm. How long do you think you can hold out? Until you're all dead. Now, why didn't you kill all of us this morning when you had the chance? You could have. I know. I got sick. I started killing people, I realized they were just fools and I shouldn't be killing them, but it was too late. So I came up here where I could get angry again. Why did you do it? When I was a kid, my folks took me to visit Mexico City. Now, always remember the way my father acted loud and big. And my mother didn't like the people because she thought they didn't wash enough. 
I can, I can see my mother and my father coming to Mars and acting the same way. Anything that's strange is no good to us. We aren't fit to take over this planet. But to kill two men. How would you feel if a Martian spit on the White House floor? You know, you haven't acted very civilized yourself. Today. I'll kill you all off, Wilder. That'll delay the next rocket five years, and then I'll kill them, too. And if I'm lucky, I'll live to be 60. And I'll meet every expedition that lands on Mars. Oh, I'll be very friendly. I'll explain our rocket blew up one day. And then I'll kill them off. And I'll save Mars for half a century. And by then, maybe the Earth people will give up. And yet you're outnumbered. We already have you surrounded. In an hour, you will be dead. I found an underground passage that'll take me back in the hills, Wilder. I'll go back there, and then I'll pick you off one by one. We'll see. Well, it's a nice town you've got here, Spender. It's beautiful. I'd like to live here. You can. Join me. You'll not like them. Why go back to them, Captain? I'll, I'll show you what a good life these people had. I'll be... No. No, there's too much earth blood in me. I may even agree with you about all this... But that does not change what I must do. You won't stay? No. This is your last chance, Bender. Look, you're sick. Now come along with me quietly. No. no. One, one last thing. If you win, do me a favor. Try to see that they don't tear this planet apart. Right. And if it helps, just... Think of me as a very crazy fellow who went berserk one summer day. Be easier on you that way. Now I'll think that over. So long, Spender. Bye, Captain. Good luck. The men spread out again, walking and then running on the hot hillside places where there would be sudden cool grottos that smelled of moss and sudden open blasting places that smelled of sun or stone. The men ran and ducked and ran and squatted in the shadows. I'll blow his brains! Captain Wilder hugged the rock warmed by the sun. He gasped, for the air was thin and not meant for running. Spender lay at the top of the hill, and a gap in the rocks showed the white of his shirt against the shadows. Wilder looked at the towers of the little clean Martian village, like sharply carved chess pieces lying in the afternoon. He saw the rocks and the interval between where Spender's chest was revealed. Go on, Spender. Get out. You've only got a few seconds to escape. Go on. Get out of the caves. Come back later. Here, go now. I've got to win this. I've got to think that I'm right. Pull this trigger. Go now. Get out. I'll get him. A slug in the head. I'll blow his bloody brain. No, fuck you. Put down that gun. I'll do this myself. Oh, Spender. Why didn't you get out? Why? Why? They buried him in that ancient valley town, where the music of the wind played on through the days and the nights. They laid him in an ancient silver sarcophagus with waxes and wines which were 10,000 years old, his hands folded on his chest. The last they saw of him was his peaceful face in the cold silver light of the racing twin moons. The captain found the poem in Spender's pocket, and he read it before he shut the marble door. So we'll go no more a-roving so late into the night. Though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. Though the night was made for loving and the day returns too soon. Yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. The next afternoon, Parkhill did some target practice in one of the dead cities, shooting out the crystal windows and blowing the tops off the fragile towers. 
Captain Wilder caught Park Hill and nearly knocked his teeth out. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you the Ray Bradbury story and the moon be still as bright, adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were John Larkin, Clark Gordon, Dick Hamilton, Nelson Olmstead, Lawrence Kerr, and Stan Early. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. X-1. Down in the depths of the Euclidean underwater city, the little band of adventurers whom we have come to know as the Gregory Party find themselves faced with a new problem and probably a new danger. The Euclidean girl submarine commander who helped them to escape from the island has been put out of the Euclidean colony and made a prisoner with the Gregory Party. Jerry and Joan believe the girl to be a good friend of theirs, but Captain Bradford isn't so sure. Some emergency has stopped all activity on Euclidea. And Mrs. Gregory and the captain have gone to find out what they can. Jerry and Joan remain with a girl submarine commander in their quarters. Hey, you know, Joan, there was something mighty funny about the way Tex was acting when he went out of here. His manner seemed to be very abrupt. Well, it was more than that. Golly, Tex doesn't get excited very often. But he was sure off balance about something this time. Do you think that we said or did anything to offend him? I believe I know what was troubling the captain. Hmm? What? For some reason, which I cannot understand, he suddenly became suspicious of me. Of you, Elaine? Precisely. Well, well, what did you do? Nothing. I merely asked permission to take part in all of your discussions for plans to escape. And the captain decided to leave the room, taking Mrs. Gregory with him. Oh, that didn't have anything to do with it. Surely not. I appreciate your confidence in me. But you are mistaken. I have studied too thoroughly the expressions of faces under strain. I know what the captain was thinking. However, it will not change my plans. I would like to help you, and will continue to do so to the best of my ability. Oh, gee, Elaine, we know that. Now, quit worrying about it, and tell Joan and me what this, uh, this emergency or something, what's it all about? I have no more definite knowledge than you two. But I recognized the existence of such an emergency when the concentrated food pellets were substituted for our regular food. Do you think that all of the Euclidians are now engaged in some important work and could not spare the time to prepare our usual meal? Precisely. What may have happened, we can only surmise. But it must be serious. Well, at least they're still here. Thank heaven for that. Hey, they're all excited about something. What has happened, Mother? Oh, a great deal. You three haven't moved out of this room since we left? No, sir. We have followed your instructions to the letter, Captain. Good. Now we'll have to work fast. Doing what? Escaping from this place. Escaping? Yes, Joan, dear. We have a greater chance now than we'll ever have again. What has happened? One of the chambers... Silence! What? I am sorry. I forgot for the moment. But if you had not spoken, if I had been allowed to count the strokes of that alarm gong... I could have told you where the accident occurred. Oh, well, then, I'm sorry. I know about what is happening, but I'm not sure where. I have counted the strokes. There were twelve. Twelve. Chamber twelve. The airplane testing chamber. What does it mean? The chamber is being flooded. They would sound a general alarm for nothing else. Well, it's general, all right. Every Euclidean in the place was running toward the other end of this first big cave. Yes. That would be correct. Chamber 12 is diametrically opposite our entrance to the city. Oh, but but if that place is flooded, we'll we'll all drown. Isn't there anything we can do? Oh, I thought something of trying to steal one of those rocket planes, but 
guards and the locks would stop us. If the guards are still there. Those men will remain. I have a plan. Well, hurry up with it. We need it. By all means, Elaine, hurry. If the captain will allow me. Huh? You must trust me now, Captain. Well, how did you know that I... I, Well, uh, I mean, what makes you think I don't? That's not important now. I have a plan which may save all of our lives. Oh, we'll hear it gladly. Did you see your three former employees in the agricultural section? Yes, McLeod, the skipper, and Jim Lowe are still among their pigs and chickens. They would be of no assistance to the Euclidians. I will take them with me as I pass through there. Where is my Euclidean uniform? Well, in my room. Yeah, Give but... it to me. Well, Hurry. I'll get it. Well, well, what's the idea, Lane? I am going to steal a rocket plane, taking your three employees with me. My Euclidean uniform may get me through the guards, who will not know that I am no longer a Euclidean. If I can get into one of the rocket planes and out into the water, we are saved, at least for the moment. Oh, yeah, you are. But what about us? We have an Euclidean uniform to sneak past those guards with. You will go up this narrow steel corridor leading to the airlock near the surface of the water. You mean the one we found in the crest of the volcanic crater? Precisely. In a panel in the wall, you will find helmets. Put them on. Wait there for me. When the shadow of my plane is over you, fill the lock with water and leave it. I will take you aboard. But what about provisions and what of these Euclideans? Please pull that uniform over my head quickly. I have no time to remove my dress. Oh, very well. Help me there, John. Yes, Mother. I, I will take as many precautions as time will permit uh, to safeguard the escape. But uh, we will run certain risks. Oh, golly whiskers. We're used to that. How long will it take you to do all this? Probably less than 180 seconds. I will hurry. And you will not have more than enough time to gain the surface lock. But what if you fail? You will still be safe. Gee, golly, that girl's got nerve. Well, Tex? Oh, I'm sorry I suspected her. Well, this is no time for such worries. We must be on our way. Yeah, that's right. But if she gets a rocket plane up there in three minutes, we can't get there much ahead of her. Right. Come on, let's go. What do we take with us? Nothing but the clothes we have on. But, Tex, we're 4,000 miles from Los Angeles. Oh, and that rocket plane will make it in four hours. That's it, Pat. All we need is a chance to get away. Are you sure you remember which corridor we take? Oh, we found it once. Yes, and we'll find it again. Now, come on, out you go. Everybody, hurry. Well, let's see. We turn this corner right around to the left. Will you lead the way, Jerry? A good idea. You and Joe in the middle, Pat. Come on, now, I'll bring up the rear. All right. Well, come on, then. Now, we'll have to hurry to beat that girl to the top of this thing. Oh, I don't like to be walking on this noiseless steel at a time like this. It's too easy for someone to slip up on us. So Jerry and I thought, Mother, until we discovered that all of these polished steel walls act as mirrors if anyone is following or approaching you. Why, sure they do. If we can see ourselves in them, why, we could see other people. Well, if anybody could see how we look now, they'd sure get a laugh out of us. We aren't dressed for... A thousand-mile trip, and we're going to get wet and cold in that water. Yeah, and we're also going to get away from you, Clutia. If we can trust that girl... I think you may do so, Captain. Well, I don't want you to think that I'm in the habit of running around suspecting people without reason. So I'll tell you why I'm afraid of that girl. Come on, let's keep walking as I tell you. Oh, yeah? Well, what is it? Well, she's been carrying a ray gun around with her. She advised us to leave ours in the sleeping room. Are you sure of that? Positive. I think I can explain that. Oh, golly... I wish you would, June, so the captain would stop suspecting that swell girl. I will. The commander, or Elaine, as we now know her, was afraid that Jerry might use the ray guns at the wrong moment, act on the spur of the moment, and do us more harm than good. Oh, is that so? She didn't think I had enough sense to take care of one of those things, huh? Well, maybe maybe she isn't such a swell girl after all. Oh, take it easy, kid. It was all for your own good. Oh, well, I suppose it was, but... Golly, well, I never did get out in fun out of things that were for my own good. Well, at least that relieves our minds. This is a, a very steep climb. How much farther must we go? Only a little ways now. I think I can see the door to the lock. There, just just ahead of us. Oh, that can't be, Tex. We made a turn just before we came to the door. You sure of that, Jerry? You bet I'm sure. Tex, suppose you can't locate the door. Uh, we'll locate it, all right. <laughs> We did locate him. Oh, no, we didn't. That's just the turn in the wall you bumped into. You are correct, Jerry. How much, Father? Getting tired, Pat? Well, we're climbing awfully fast. Oh, it's just a little ways now. We're walking on solid rock. We must have come up at least 200 feet, I think. No, no, not quite. 
Our quarters are about 200 feet below the surface, and this lock is about 30 feet. Oh, here's the door, Tex. Right. Now get the palms of your hands against it. Aye, aye, Skipper. Why, that door slides down. Yes, Mother. I presume there is no room for it to slide in any other direction. That's right. We're in a narrow ledge of rock in the edge of the old volcano crater. <laughs> Mighty little room. All right. Okay, now, in we go. Now, where's that panel with the diving helmets in it? It must be here, Jerry. This is the only opaque panel in the entire room. Mm. Well, let's have a look then. Here, I'll give you a hand, Jerry. Now, Pat, you and Joan watch out into the water in all directions. Tell us the minute you see the shadow of that girl's rocket plane on the surface. It takes. She isn't on time. Uh, she didn't give herself enough time. We're not ready for her anyway. I've got it, Tex. It's opening. Hey, and there's the helmet. And here comes the shadow of the... Why, why, I thought you said she'd have a rocket plane. That shadow was made by a submarine. I think not. Here, now. Here, start putting on your helmet. No, Mother. The rocket planes look like submarines. There's a helmet for you, Joan. Come on, get into it quick. Right. Now, you go up first, Jerry. All right, you next, Joan. Then Pat. Now follow. Open that valve, kid. Open it is. Now, helmet's on quick. Now, just swim up. It's only 30 feet. Lock is opening. All right, shoot, kid. Good luck, everybody. Hey, Skipper! Open up, will you? Come aboard as rapidly as possible, Jerry. Make room for the others. Okay, Skipper. Boy, you sure move fast. Hey, Joe, over here. Hey, come in, Jerry. Throw away your helmet. I have done so. Up forward, out of the way, Jerry. Hurry, Joe. I will get in as rapidly as possible. Everybody here? All here, Tex. Where's Jerry? Jerry is aboard. Hurry up forward, Joe. Come, Mrs. Gregory. Well, I'll do my best. Oh, these wet clouds. Hey, wait a minute. I'll give you a hand, Pat. Up forward, please, Mrs. Gregory. Be in the second lane. Close the door after you. I will prepare to take off. Okay, Elaine. Now we're all ship shape. Brace yourselves up forward as well as you can. We are crowded, but not overloaded. We will now take off. Five. We're off again. And in four hours, we'll be home. Four thousand miles away. That's pretty fast, but it's the best way to leave Euclidia. Hey, Elaine, where's the skipper, McLeod, and the Chinese cook? They are in the forward baggage compartment. Everyone is safe. I will set my course for Los Angeles. How soon will the Euclidians take out after us? Not four hours. I have magnetized their submarine locks. We will not be overtaken on this flight. Once more, the Gregory party has escaped from Euclidia. It seems a little out of place to escape from the very locality you've come to capture, but sometimes a well-ordered retreat is the best manner of attack. Captain Bradford has discovered exactly where and how he will use his universal solvent to take over the weird underwater colony of Euclidia. But he hasn't any of the materials necessary to compound the formula, and the only way to get them is a quick return to Los Angeles. The Euclidean girl submarine commander has proven a real friend and has taken one of the Euclidean rocket planes. We find the girl commander at the controls now as the entire Gregory party of seven other people ride with her at a speed of 1,000 miles an hour. They have been in the air four hours since leaving Euclidia and are almost over Los Angeles. I believe, Captain Bradford, that we will be ready to land in Los Angeles in less than 600 seconds. Ten minutes to Los Angeles? Precisely. And we've come more than 4,000 miles in four hours. Well, the wonderful part about it is there's no noise, no sensation. Well, there was plenty of sensation when that plane like this one went down with us, wasn't there, Tex? Yeah, plenty, Jerry, but Elaine seems to have better luck with this one. I think it is not a matter of luck, Captain. Elaine is the finest pilot in Euclidia. Right, Joan. Yes, Joan, dear. 
The type of flying Elaine has done during the past four hours wasn't luck. I'm glad my work as a pilot meets with your approval. Oh, it certainly does, Elaine. Oh, Mother! Yes, Joan? Look, look down! Oh, I've been looking. Can't see a thing. Not much visibility. Uh, what's our altitude now, Elaine? We have descended to 4,000 feet. 4,000 feet? Well, that must be a very heavy fog below us. It is indeed. And soon it will be all around us. I must descend if we hope to locate Los Angeles. Yes, and after we locate, it's going to be fun to find a place to land there. Surely it will not be difficult. We will have the entire ocean. Oh, no, we won't. You just can't flop down the rocket plane anywhere around Los Angeles. Well, you'd have so many people around you, you'd be sunk before you could land. That is not reasonable, Jerry. It is to us, Elaine. Our people have never seen anything like this. Afraid that won't do, Elaine. We'll have to locate some place where we can get out of this plane and hide away before anybody knows we're home. I cannot help you now. I know nothing of small bodies of water near your home. I got it. Can't we get word to Johnson to meet us? Well, of course, Jerry. But it will have to be someplace very near home. Elaine says we'll be over the city in a few minutes. Well, this is close to home, all right. If it's big enough. How much water do you need to land this ship in? I mean, how long a body of water? I would prefer a hundred feet. I can land in 80 if it is necessary. 80 feet? But this plane is 65 feet long. Precisely. My helium tanks are full. We will inflate the shell to its capacity using the emergency balloons of fabric. It is possible to settle down almost vertically. You mean you've got balloons hidden in the roof of this thing? And all you've got to do is turn some helium into them? Precisely. Well, golly, whiskers. Yeah, me too, son. Hey, we're losing altitude rapidly now, aren't we? We are. I would suggest that you call your Mr. Johnson at once. Oh, he'll be so surprised. When we talked to him an hour ago, we were a thousand miles from here. Mr. Johnson knows our speed. He will be waiting for the call. Is this radio ready now, Elaine? You may proceed. Well, where's your body of water, Jerry? Lake Hollywood. Lake Hollywood. Is that large enough, Tex? Plenty large enough. We've got several hundred feet of water surface there, but it's in a bad spot in the fog. I will not worry about the fog, Captain Bradford. When you assure me we are within reasonable range of this lake, I will take care of the fog. You will what? I will remove the fog from my path. I did not know that was possible. In fact, I am learning that I knew very little of Euclidia. I think we're all learning that, Joe. But how can you do anything about it? Hold it, Jerry. I'd better get Johnson. C.Q. Johnson. Hello, Johnson. Bradford to Johnson. Are you getting me? Go ahead, Bradford. Your signal is strong. Johnson. Waiting. Go ahead. We're almost over Los Angeles. Be there in a matter of five minutes or so. Going to land on Lake Hollywood. Rush up there with transportation for eight of us. Keep it quiet. Repeat. Meet you at Lake Hollywood as soon as possible. Transportation for eight. Keep it quiet. Johnson. That's all. Uh, Wait, Johnson. Hold on. Waiting. Leave the gates open so we can run into the grounds and into the house on the double quick. We might pick up a curious friend. That's all. Everything will be ready. That's all. Your man, Johnson, is dependable. Oh, Johnson's a treasure. He thought we were all lost when the island sank beneath that artificial eruption. But when we located him with the radio an hour ago, he was as calm as if we'd just left him at lunch. I would say that Mr. Johnson had never given up hope of news from us. He sure hadn't. And I can't see why. Well, I can. Johnson came down on one of those boats that saw the eruption and sailed away. But Johnson wasn't fooled a bit. He knew that if the explosion had been real... The island had actually been destroyed. Something, some evidence of it would have floated to the surface. What an amazingly simple reasoning. Almost childish. Yet none of us thought of it except Tex. And Johnson. You will learn, Elaine, that Captain Bradford and Mr. Johnson do many amazing things together. That is obvious. One moment. Captain Bradford. Uh, Yes? The fog is not solid ahead. I see a tall building. Oh, well, that's the Los Angeles City Hall. We're too low to get over to Lake Hollywood. You take the controls, Captain. Hey, hey, I'm no wizard with these ships. You are familiar with landmarks. I will retard our speed to 100 miles an hour or less. You will fly us into a position over the lake. I will land the plane. Okay, Skipper. How far are we from the lake, Captain? Only a few miles. Uh, Cut the speed as much as you can, will you, Elaine? I am doing so. And I will begin to use helium in the shell. After I attain 100% buoyancy, the speed may be negligible. Boy, oh boy. I hope we don't wind up on Lookout Mountain. I'm taking no chances, Jerry. I can get an occasional glimpse of Riverside Drive down there. I'll follow it around behind the hills. Uh, That's the easiest way to get in. 
Are we not in great danger of being seen from the ground? Oh, I should think so, but we can't do anything about it. We are making no sound, and we will not attract much attention, merely passing through openings in this fog. Yeah, I guess we're all right there. Yeah, nobody could get a second look at us anyway. Well, we're nearly there, but it cut speed some more. I am doing so. Johnson can't possibly get to the lake from my home in this length of time, Tex. He won't be far behind us, and remember that we're not down the lake yet. The fog is thicker here, is it not? Sure is. I can't see any holes in it now. Well, I've got the general direction of the lake spotted, but I'll never hit it exactly in this step. Well, what did you say about controlling the fog? I will use the fog ray. That will give us perfect visibility from this plane to the ground in a circle 100 feet in diameter. Gee, can you do that? I said I would do it. Well, isn't it time to try it, Tex? I don't like to use it until we absolutely have to. That circle cut out of the fog is going to attract the attention of anyone we fly over. There is no other course, Captain. You cannot land in this fog. You're right, Joan. I guess turn on, Skipper. I am doing so. I never saw anybody who could be doing what people want you to do before they want it, like you can. I have been well trained. Joan, Jerry, look down. Mother, we can see the ground. Sure can. The ray is not perfectly focused for this altitude. I will clear it up. No, no, don't. A little haze along the ground may be our greatest protection. I can see what I want. <laughs> and I'm way off my course. Are we in danger, Captain? <laughs> the only danger we're in is that of going to San Francisco. We're miles over into the valley. I can't get used to the speed of these things. We are now making only 80 miles an hour. Well, it's that fog, Tex. You can't gauge your speed through that stuff. Here, yeah, I'll cut it around hard. At 80 miles an hour, we should be over the lake in a couple of minutes. Is the lake entirely surrounded by mountains? Well, they're not exactly mountains, Joan. Just hills. But even so, it would be a little embarrassing to fly into one. Mm, no danger of that with this fog cleared away under us. Yeah, it doesn't do any good straight ahead, though. Don't need it, son. I know every wrinkle in this terrain. We'll slip in over the lake uh, with a hundred feet to spare. That should be ample. Perhaps. But it is not a great deal. No, Joan, dear, but we haven't a great deal of time either. Remember that it would defeat our purpose to be discovered at this time. It would appear that this local fog is most fortunate. Mm, it sure is. All right, Elaine, take it over. There's the lake right under us. Oh, golly. Now we overshot it. That is of no moment. I will circle down and remain within this radius. Are we going to land smoothly? There is no reason why we should not. Why do you ask? Well, the rest of our crew aren't any too comfortable crowded into that front compartment. Gee, that's right. You know, we ought to tell them we're going to land so they can brace themselves. That will not be necessary. I will now cut off all power. Can we just drift down to the lake surface? Precisely. May I make a suggestion? You may. As soon as you are stabilized over the lake and within a hundred feet of the surface, would it not be wise to allow the fog to surround us again? That would remove any possibility of our being observed from the shore of the lake. Good idea, Joan. Uh, how about that, Elaine? I will stop the fog ray. We are now directly over the center of the lake and less than 100 feet above it. Isn't there any wind which might blow us slightly off the landing? None. I will now release the helium balloons from our upper surface. Boy, we sure stopped going down. Not entirely, Jerry. We are descending slowly. What a novel way to land a plane. Why shouldn't this prove practical for our own planes, Ted? It would. And after we take care of those Euclidians, we'll put a lot of these ideas to work in our world. We are nearly to the surface. Hey, any minute now we'll hit. Get set, everybody. No preparation is necessary. The landing will not disturb you. And that fog is so thick we can't see a thing. Uh, nobody can see us. Good thing they can. Boy, what a story this would make in Hollywood. I suppose it's silly, but... I'm getting a little nervous. We should soon be down. We are resting on the surface of the water. Huh? Down? But Elaine, I couldn't even tell when we landed. Naturally not. The helium balloons compensated perfectly for our landing. Uh, can you taxi over the shore without making any noise? Easily. But would it not be well to wait until we know where Mr. Johnston is? I know where he'll be. At the dam on the south end. Then I will use small jets of gas and feel my way slowly to the south end. Golly. We're home. We're here, Mrs. Gregory. Yes, Jerry, we're home. And less than four and a half hours ago, we were over 4,000 miles from here. It is indeed remarkable. But one thing is not clear to me. What's that, Joan? This fog will not remain here. How will we hide the rocket plane? Oh, yeah, that's right. After we leave it, I will flood the outer shell. 
The plane will sink in the lake and remain in perfect condition and safely hidden until we want it again. Well, it looks as if our troubles are nearly over. Yes, they are for the moment. But we still have the little matter of going back to Euclidean, and capturing those men and doing that in a matter of hours. That we will be able to do. I will now land you at the south side of the lake. guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell. The term genius is fairly common in our language today. I wonder how many of you realize that the term originated with the old Arabian Nights concept of the genie. You know, the magical creature that came in a bottle and had such wonderful powers. The story is about a whole planet of geniuses. Genie. Uh, interesting people to try to enslave, you know. Laboratory scientists have as much fun as anybody else, you know. One of the laboratory laws, sometimes called Finagle's Law or Murphy's Law, goes, in any laboratory experiment, if something can go wrong, it will. Well, this is the story of a planet-sized laboratory experiment in which something could go wrong. Professor Heim to His Excellency Marshal Gorham. The ship is now in orbit about the planet of destination. Good. Good. Have a lifeboat prepared for descent with an invisibility screen. Yes, Your Excellency. How many crewmen will you want to take along? None. It will be just myself and you, Professor Hein. Sir, you, the marshal, landing on a barbarian world without even an, an escort, and begging your pardon, sir, but... Uh... Do you mean that the Grand Marshal of the Galactic Imperial Armed Forces can't carry out an undercover inspection on a backward planet without a dozen Marines clanking in his wake? No, sir. No, sir. And please remember that the people down there have no weapon more powerful than a bow and arrow. Whereas I will be carrying a nuclear blaster under my coat. Yes, sir. Of course, Your Excellency. And while we are down there on that planet, uh, Professor Heim, stand by for possible action. We may have to bombard the place with cobalt missiles. Wipe all the life off it. Sterilize the entire planet, sir? You heard me, Professor. I said we may have to. Not that we will. It depends on what I find down there. That peaceful, primitive world may turn out to be just another stupid scientific experiment. Or it may turn out to be the worst danger of the Empire and all its stars have faced for a thousand years. Now, I want you, Professor. I'm in my office at once. Over. Yes, Your Excellency. Over and out. <laughs> Oh, there you are, Professor Hyde. Yes, Marshal Gorham, here I am. We've arrived at your experimental planet. I know. I was just watching it float there among the constellations. I don't know a more beautiful sight in the universe. Well, break out the native customs for us, too. We're going down. At once? I am a military man, Professor, not one of your psychologists. Now, so far, your people have spent 1,500 years studying that planet. But as for me, there's war on the imperial borders, and I can spare three days. Three days to decide. To decide whether we can let your experiment go on or whether to, to discontinue it, shall I say? But only three days. Marshal, you don't realize that it would take a week just to explain the statistics of... I know, I've heard it all. Fifteen hundred years ago, the Psychological Research Foundation decided to learn what makes human history tick by running controlled experiments. So it took a lot of uninhabited planets and put different kinds of people on them. Their memories wiped out, Marshal. The first generation started out knowing as little as animals. They, they had to discover everything for themselves. Fire, language, the wheel. Do you imagine that their descendants could have learned enough to menace us? To threaten an empire that for 3,000 years has controlled millions of planetary systems? Well, we've been through all this before, I am. I've told you again and again, I'm not worried about your other experimental worlds. They're still cavemen or less. But this planet here... Pure genius stock. 
A planet where nobody has an IQ below 150. And God knows how high they go. Well, I just can't tell about them. And His Majesty is worried, too. There have been rumors. He sent me here himself to decide whether or not those rumors could be true. But the people down there don't even know the Galactic Empire exists. Why, the men there are, are still farming with plows and sailing steamships. Sure, sure, one of it. Ordinary men on Earth with an average IQ of 100 needed maybe half a million years to get as far as your geniuses have in 1500. I understand they've already developed Newtonian physics, chemical batteries, telescopes, world government. At that rate, they'll be visiting the other planets of this system in 50 years. They'll reach the stars in a century, and then they'll be loose in the Galactic Empire. Do you think they'd fit tamely into the caste system like good subjects of the Emperor? Why, they couldn't even if they tried. They'd produce a new invention and a new philosopher every day. And that would mean the end of stability, and that, Professor, would mean the end of the Empire. So you say, but you're a soldier. You don't understand. Yes, I know. I'm a dirty militarist who can't see past the end of my own guns. All I'm good for is killing, huh? And you're a noble intellectual scientist. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that just before, Professor, and I've gotten pretty tired of it. But I tell you, the genius people are, are cooperative in that. My orders are to inspect the place and decide for myself whether they're right or not. So that's what I'm going to do. Come along, Ayn. Exploring Tomorrow continues in just a moment. When driving, luck can stay with you for years. But on the road, it can leave you in a split second, a tragic split second. So drive carefully. You will live longer and you will arrive alive. There's been considerable discussion of what constitutes good and evil over the last few millenniums. But, you know, there's an interesting comment someone made. I don't know where it did originate. Melodrama is the conflict between good and evil. And tragedy is the conflict between good and good. When two good men, each with a good point to make, get into conflict, that's where real tragedy starts. All right, Professor. I've got the life boat into the atmosphere and leveled off. So where do I head now? All right. Wake up, you wool-headed dreamer. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry, Marshal. I, I was thinking, looking out the porthole and thinking. What about? How lovely the sky is. So blue. And the land below, mountains and forests and hopeful young farms. Oh, no. A poet yet. Well, I'm thinking about my job of inspection. Where shall we go? Fly mm -hmm. north, northeast for 700 kilometers and you'll find this planet's largest city. It's also the capital of their world government. That'll do. I should be able to observe a pretty good cross-section of the genius race. Do you seriously believe you can decide the fate of an entire world on the basis of what you see in one city? How do you expect to learn anything even there? You don't speak any of the local language, and not even the international one that developed. You'll talk for both of us. We'll claim to be visitors from a long ways off, the opposite hemisphere. We'll just wander around town for a couple of days, and I'll get the feel of the place. You... You mean you, you decide whether these people live or die just on a basis of a, of a hunch? Now, here we are. Landed in an empty meadow. You're sure nobody will happen by? Well, what do they do? The lifeboat is invisible. Well, even so. Well, we don't want the genius people learning the truth, uh, do we, Professor? Well, of course not, on that, you and I do agree. But my own motive is that I, I don't want to spoil the experiment. Come on, let's get moving. We'll have to hike into the city. Well, it's nice outdoors. Sunshine. I don't know when I last breathed air that didn't come out of a tank. And you turn all this into black radioactive ash. Come on, I said, let's start walking. There's a road. Hmm. It's pretty well paved. Oh, yes. Ten years ago, this was a livestock trail. Today, they're driving steam automobiles over it. I predict that ten years from now, the first airplane will use this for a landing strip. But where's the mass market to support all that progress? There isn't much of one. Actually, most people here are still riding around in buggies. 
You see, they have a unique social system. The average man on this planet would rather buy a new book than a new gadget. But at the same time, their engineers keep on making inventions because... A mind of such power can't help being creative. And I tell you, the Empire can't afford what you call creativeness. So this is their biggest city. Why? There are about a million people in it. <laughs> You call that a city? Considering the small population of this world? Yes. <laughs> it's backward, all right. Carts pulled by animals. Water pumped by windmills. Bearded men in clothes of vegetable fiber. Wood in plaster houses. Gas lamps. That's what I, I keep telling you, Marshal. These people aren't demons. They're as human as you and I. They're born the same way as us. Grow up, learn, love, laugh, weep and die like human beings anywhere in all space and time. They simply happen to be more intelligent. Let them live. Seventy generations ago, they were savages. They didn't even know how to chip a flint. And now they've come to this. Yes. Our observers mingling with him in disguise have already learned more about his particle dynamics than... Oh, sure, this city is still primitive. But in another hundred years, they have schools, laboratories. They don't frown on artists and scientists and philosophers. They glorify them. So, in a hundred years, they'll be out among the stars. And we don't dare allow that. But they won't, Marshal. Not necessarily. If only you'd let me show you the economic data. For instance, the great uninhabited spaces they still have right on their home planet. Shut up, I'm thinking. Thinking? I don't think you're able to. What did you say? Uh, nothing. I have a knife, Grand Marshal Gorham. You don't know that, do you? You think I'm just another ineffectual little dreamer, don't you? Well, you may find out different. <laughs> If by militarist we mean someone who believes that it is necessary to use physical force to carry out, to implement a theory, a belief, then uh, it looks to me like Professor Heim has become a militarist. He intends to use force, doesn't he? Hello, Tussola. Uh, Saban, What did he say, that, that bellhop or whatever he was? He wished us good night in the international language. He thinks we're foreigners, you remember? Ha! <laughs> if he only knew how foreign. That's a cheap way to feel superior, isn't it? Oh, shut up, Heim. I'm still trying to decide what to do about this planet. There are too many paradoxes. The waiter in the restaurant wanted to ask you about the ethnology of the country he thought we came from. This is a nice, clean hotel room, but it doesn't have running water. And yet the clerk downstairs was reading what I swear must have been a mathematical journal. Does that make them monsters? Under the social system here, such routine jobs are done by students. And, of course, every person on this planet goes through at least five years of college. But that's all it amounts to, Gorham. A whole world of long-haired dreamers who are experimenting with aircraft and rockets, who developed the theory of evolution before they learned how to smelt iron. I don't trust them. Of course, you don't understand them. You're too... I, I, I mean... Too stupid? Isn't that what you're going to say, Professor? I'm just a dumb militarist who worked his way from private soldier to grand marshal of the Galactic Empire. No fine scientist, just a hired hand keeping the barbarian raiders off your scientific back. Well, Professor Hammer, happen to be the man who will decide what's to become of this planet of geniuses. And have you decided yet, Your Excellency? Not yet. I can still take a couple of days to... Two more days? After the Foundation worked for 1,500 years? Wait. What are you doing? This is a knife in my hand, Marshal Gorham. Don't move. If you reach for that blaster, I'll kill you. You go, go, go crazy, huh? No. You're the crazy one. You're the lunatic who wouldn't blood out man's last best hope, this planet. You'll allow yourself three days to decide the whole future of the world. Unbuckle that blaster. Don't let your hand come near the trigger. out. Drop it on the floor. Take it over to me. So. Now I've got you where I want you. But, Professor, I haven't decided anything yet. I might decide this experiment is safe. I might still report to the Emperor. There's nothing to be afraid of. He can forget your race. <laughs> you might. But I know you won't. I'm going to kill you, Marshal Gorham. 
I'm going to report to the spaceship captain that you died accidentally. And then I'm going to hope that the next Imperial inspector will be more reasonable. Look out! Turn back, you fool! No! I always stabbed you in the arm that time, Marshal Gorham. But you're in a corner now. I'll get you this time. Go! Go, Maradon! Go along! Or I don't get along here, right? Who's stomach, Sholte Claw? Claw! You, you, you spoke, you spoke their language. You already know the language of this planet. Aye. The attendant has the key, of course. He's coming in. Drop that knife, Professor Hein. He's a husky chap. Shalom, Aye. Yeah. Take no order. Drop that knife, I said, Professor. Yes, of course. Sit down, Heim. You look more shocked than I am. Come on, the mat, you're done. He's gone after the first aid kit for me. Not that you hurt me seriously. I, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. And you, you're a native of this planet yourself. Yes. I was born here, though I've lived most of my life out in the Empire. <laughs> we thought we were keeping a planet full of geniuses and ignorance. How long have you known? We began to suspect the truth 500 years ago. And we discovered that all life had evolved from lower forms, but couldn't find a subhuman ancestor for man. And finally, your disguised observers were identified. You even used blind man techniques to spot those wearing invisibility screens. <laughs> Did you really expect you could go on fooling a race with twice your brain power? <laughs> well, uh, we thought so. Yes, I, I suppose it was foolish. <laughs> Some of us wormed our way into space as throwaways are, are in disguise, that sort of thing. People here live quietly so as not to give the show away. We don't tell our children the truth till they're old enough to keep up the pretense. But meanwhile, for the past 300 years, our agents have been out in the Empire learning everything you know, posing as citizens working up into the key positions of your government. We can do that by sheer merit. Yes, obviously, you can become Imperial Marshals. Right. <laughs> and when the Emperor got suspicious, he... He sent me, his trusted soldier, a notorious anti-intellectual, to check up for him. Naturally, I was going to give this planet a clean bill of health, but I had to string you along first to make it look good. Evidently, I put on a better act than I had planned. And now that I, I know your secret... I'll have to report that you were accidentally killed here, Professor. But don't worry. All you have to do is uh, spend the rest of your life here as one of us. I don't think you'll mind that. Oh, no. Not personally. I, I, I'd enjoy it. I used to envy the people on this world. But uh, when you, uh, well, your race, I mean, when you've completely taken over the Galactic Empire from Athene, uh, what do you plan to do? Well, we'll remodel it, shall I say. I'm afraid you wouldn't understand exactly what we intend to do. It's a little beyond your grasp. But, but it will be for the benefit of the ordinary Galactic citizen, too. <laughs> The poor, backward, benighted galactic empire. say that the first requirement for teaching a dog to do tricks is that you have to know more than the dog. If you want to teach a plant full of geniuses to do tricks for you, first make sure you know more than the geniuses. You can enslave some kinds of entities, but you can't enslave, you can't impose on entities who are more intelligent, more thoughtful, more wise than you yourself. Uh, what will happen is they'll turn out to be helping you in disguise. Fascinating adventure in Exploring Tomorrow. 
Heard in our cast tonight were Ron Dawson and Al Ruscio. Script was by Powell Anderson, produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Guy Wallace speaking. <laughs> the transcription feature, Superman! Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Yes, it's Superman! Strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, then steal in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. And now to our story. Convinced that Clark Kent is a government agent investigating the illegal business in which they seem to be engaged, the two hard-bitten men, known to us only as Bull and Chuck, have set steel bear traps along the forest trail they expect Kent to take in trying to run them down. The traps, well hidden under a layer of snow are strong enough to hold a 600-pound bear. As dawn breaks over the clearing in which Kent, Jimmy, and their guide, Batiste, have camped for the night, none of them is even remotely aware of the danger lurking along the forest trail. Seated around the fire, they're finishing the breakfast Batiste has prepared for them while the guide tends his dogs. I don't know when I've tasted better fried ham. Wasn't it swell, Jimmy? Uh Uh-huh. You don't sound very enthusiastic. In fact, you didn't even finish the ham. What's the matter? Nothing. Oh, now, look, young fellow, don't try to kid me. I know your appetite, particularly out here in the open. When you leave anything on your plate, there's something serious the matter with you. What is it? Nothing's the matter, Mr. Kent. Don't you feel well? Oh, I feel fine. Oh, what's bothering you, Jim? Oh, nothing. <laughs> you remember what I told you yesterday about exasperating me? And you're doing it now. Oh, I don't mean to, Mr. Kent. It's just that... that... All right, come on, get it off your chest. Well, it's just that funny things happen. Things I don't understand. Oh? For instance? Oh, that shotgun, for instance. How did the barrel get twisted? Well, I told you, Jimmy, that some things are beyond explanation. Someday, perhaps, you'll know. You mean I'll know how the shotgun barrel got twisted? Sure, you know a lot of things. The older you grow, the more you learn. Oh, that's not what I mean. I've just got the feeling that you don't tell me everything. Don't tell you everything? Well, what haven't I told you? Oh, lots of things. Didn't I tell you how coal happened to be made and how the government operates game preserves? And... Oh, I don't mean things like that. I mean, well, the only thing I can remember now is the shotgun barrel. Oh, now, you take my advice, Jim, and forget it temporarily. Well, are you all through with breakfast? Yeah, I wasn't very hungry. Okay. Let you and I take a little walk while Batiste is feeding his dogs and cleaning up, hmm? How about it? All right. Okay. Baptiste, Jimmy and I are going for a walk. We'll be back soon. Yes, All right, come on, Jim. Where are we going, Mr. Kent? Hmm? You haven't forgotten what happened last night, Jimmy, have you? Oh, you mean the airplane and the package it dropped? Mm Mm-hmm. I thought we might look for it in the woods. Oh, those two men have probably found it by this time. Well. That's another thing that puzzles me. What? Why did you tell Batiste we were breaking camp? Aren't we going to find out who those men are and what they're doing before we leave? Yes, but I didn't want Batiste along with us while we were investigating. He's better off back at the clearing. Hey, it's pretty tough going here. <laughs> Knee deep in snow and dead branches. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't that a trail over there on the other side of that big tree? Where? Oh, yes, I think it is. Come on, Jim. Ah, here now. This is much better. Snow is packed down a bit. I wonder where this trail leads. Well, only one way to find out. Follow it. It's pretty narrow, so we'll have to walk single file, Indian style. I'll lead the way, but you keep close behind me, Jim. Okay. You don't think those men are real game warden, do you, Mr. Kent? I'm sure they're not. As a matter of fact, I think they're up to something. Something they'd like to keep undercover. What could it be? I've been trying to figure it out. 
All I can imagine is that it's some sort of illegal border traffic. Hey, I'll bet that's it. I'll bet they use the airplane. Hold up a minute, Jimmy. Wait a minute. What's the matter? Huh. Someone's been on this trail recently. See those footprints? Uh-huh. The snow over there seems to have been disturbed. and packed down as hard as the rest. Well, take a look at it. Mr. Ken, what happened? Why, my... Oh, my leg is caught in a steel trap, Jimmy. Oh, oh what'll I do? What'll I do, Mr. Ken? Don't get excited, Jimmy. Run back to the clearing and ask Baptiste for the file he carries in his dog sled kit. He uses it to keep the sled runner sharp. Is that all, Mr. Ken? Yes, that's all. Now hurry, but don't tell Baptiste what happened. I'll be right back. Kid, he did have to frighten him, but as it is, he's getting more suspicious about me every day. Look at these steel trap jaws in my leg. If there been anyone else, they would have cut right through the bone. <laughs> Listen to me, using Kent's high voice even when I'm alone. Gotten so used to it. Yeah, that's better. Now to get the trap off my leg. Ooh, that spring is certainly strong. There, that does it. Now, snap it shut. Hmm. Chances are this isn't the only trap along the trail. I'll have to watch out for Jimmy. If he steps into one of them, it'll be just too bad. Uh-oh, here he comes. Back to Clark Kent. Here's the file, Mr. Kent. Here. Oh, your leg's free. Yes, the trap was rusty, and when it snapped shut, it broke. Well, are you hurt? Oh, not a bit. But, but those steel jaws, didn't they cut into your leg? No, I guess these leather boots saved me. Put the file in your pocket, Jim. Did uh, Baptiste ask you what you wanted it for? Hell, but you said not to tell him. Good boy. All right, we can go on now, but we've got to be careful. This may not be the only trap set on the trail. You stay back a little way. That's right. I'll poke along with this branch. Mr. Ken. Yeah? Do you think those traps were set for animals or, or for us? Well, I'm wondering, Jimmy. Whoop, oh, hold up. Another spot where the snow's been disturbed. I'll dig around with a stick. It may be another... Oh, it is. Did you see those steel jaws come mm. together? Well, that's number two. No telling how many is strewn along here. Certainly weren't intended for animals. They're too close together. All right, come on. All right. If those two fake game wardens set the trap, they certainly must have something to hide. Well, no doubt about it now. Don't you worry. We'll catch up with them and get to the bottom of this. Uh, hold up, Jim. Another one? I think so. I might poke around with a stick. Now, I guess this is a false alarm. Maybe they only set two. Well, the trail's getting wider here. Can I walk alongside you? Well, you better stay behind, Jimmy. Let's not take any chances. Okay. Say, wait a minute, Mr. Kent. Huh? What's that over there in the woods? Where? Look. To our right. See it? Mm. Is it an animal? No, I don't think so. Jimmy, do you know what it is? What? The package that was dropped from the plane. Come on, let's have a look at it. Be careful you don't tumble any snowdrifts. Here, take my hand. Do you really think it's a package? I'm sure it is. Ah, here we are. All wrapped in heavy burlap. You've got a scout knife with you, haven't you? Mm Mm-hmm. Here. Thanks. Let me just cut the stitching and see what... Jimmy! Jumping catfish. Furs. Northern mink skin. Must be a thousand of them in this bundle, maybe more. Why would an airplane be dropping furs? Well, the animals were probably trapped in Canada. They bring them across the border this way to avoid paying the customs charges. And those two men who said they were game wardens are really fur smugglers. That's about it. Gosh, I've heard of diamond smugglers and gold smugglers, but this is the first time I ever heard of fur smugglers. These mink skins must be worth three or four thousand dollars. And if the duty on them is high, it pays our phony game warden friends to get them in this way. Hmm. What are we going to do with the bundle now that we found it? Take it back to the clearing. You can't carry it alone, Mr. Ken. It's huh? too heavy. Oh, well, well, we'll drag it. Grab hold. Okay. Me. That's it. It'll go easier once we get it on the trail where the snow is packed down. Up with it now. There we are. There. Now we can just pull it away. But even as Kent and Jimmy drag the cumbersome bundle of precious mink skins toward the clearing, Bull, the leader of the smuggling gang, is watching them from the window of his shack through high-powered glasses. They found the shipment, Chuck. They're taking it back with them. Oh, none of the bear traps worked in? No. I missed them, I guess. Hmm. But we ain't through. Say, uh, I'm for scramming out of here, Bill. And leave them with the evidence. Don't be stupid. 
What chance would we ever have of bringing another skin in? None at all. This would be the end of a sweet little business. Well, there ain't nothing you can do about it. They got the fur. They won't have them long. No shooting. I don't want no shooting. Cut it out. There won't be no shooting. Oh, what you gonna do? I'm gonna give you a chance to pull your crybaby act. What do you mean? You're gonna give yourself up. Oh, no. No, but look, they'll throw me in the can. Now listen to me. They won't get a chance to throw you in any can. You give yourself up. Make out like you and me had a fight and you're squealing. Huh? See? Then what? And you tell the big guy you take him to where I am. Yeah? You'll bring him to the shack. But watch out for those traps. Yeah. And when I bring him, they'll be shooting. No, no, they won't. I won't even be here. Sure. You're going to let me take the rap. You're dumber than I thought you were. Hmm? Nobody's going to take any rap. I won't be here because I'll be getting the kid and that Canuck driver. Oh. Oh, uh, uh, why? Because once I got them, I can talk turkey to the big guy, see? Yeah. Yeah, I see. All right, get going. Remember, bring the big guy back here. Alone. I suppose you don't want to come. He'll come. How'll I get clear of him after I bring him here? I'll take care of that. Go ahead. I hope this works out, Bo. If it doesn't work out, you won't have to be afraid of shooting anymore. Yes. Will Clark Kent fall for the trick separating him from Jimmy and Batiste? Or will he realize the first smugglers have something up their sleeves? There's excitement in the next episode, so don't miss it. Don't forget. Tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. <laughs> It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. Presenting the transcription feature, Superman. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman. Strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. And now to our story. As you remember, Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen, traveling by dog sled through the North Woods, and planning to cross the border into Canada, stumble into a mysterious adventure their first night out. Two hard-bitten men, known to us only as Bull and Chuck, have been engaged in the smuggling of valuable mink furs from Canada to the United States, making use of an airplane to drop large bundles of the skins near their shack in the woods. But Kent and Jimmy soon found out what was brewing and decided to investigate. They found one of the bundles that had been dropped from the plane the night before and dragged it back to their camp in a clearing. Bull, the leader of the smuggling gang, aware that Kent has the furs and suspecting him of being a government agent, plans to strike back. So Chuck, his henchman, has started for the clearing where Kent, Jimmy, and their guide Batiste have camped. Chuck has orders to pretend to give himself up, lead Kent back to the shack, and in that way give Bull a chance to get Jimmy and Batiste while they're alone. At the moment, Kent has no knowledge of this scheme. He and Jimmy and their French-Canadian guide are grouped around the bundle of furs admiring them. Listen. How much did you say they were worth, Betty? The price of skin like this, they are way up. Très magnifique. I know, but how much are they worth? A hundred dollars? Five hundred dollars? Oh, don't be silly, <laughs> Jimmy. <laughs> These skins would bring five thousand dollars in the American market. Five thousand dollars? Uh, maybe more. You mean to say what's in this bundle is worth five thousand dollars? Oh, certainly. And look at this skin. She's beautiful. So soft, so dark. Mm. Never have I seen such skin. Never. Gosh, Mr. Kent, maybe we better go into the mink hunting business. Five thousand dollars. Wow, <laughs> wait. You think it is so easy to trap the mink, won't he? You think he comes to you like puppy dog? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He's very clever, the mink. He's hard to catch. Mm. Hard and vicious, Jimmy. A mink can bite a man's finger off. Really? Oh, we, we, we. See, they belong to the rodent family. You know, rats, weasels. What? Sure. They're very timid, but once they're cornered, they fight like wildcats. 
Well, then maybe we better not go into the mink catching business. <laughs> if I'm going to be a newspaper reporter someday, I need all my fingers. Right, you are, Jimmy. Well, now that we've got five thousand dollars worth of mink skins, what are we going to do with them? Say, couldn't we keep some for a fur coat for Miss Lane? Oh, that's a nice thought, Jimmy. But you see, they don't belong to us. Now, I think the best thing to do is. What's the matter, Mister Kent? What are you staring at? There's a man coming along that trail through the woods in this direction. Don't move. I see him. One of the fake game wardens. Mr. Kibler, I get my rifle. Jerry Wabbit, he's, he's not armed. What do you think he wants, Mr. Kent? I don't know, but we'll find out soon enough. Here he comes. Don't shoot, mister. I want to talk to you. Got his hands above his head. All right, come on. Okay. This is... Looks kind of funny to be coming here, but... I got a reason. A good reason. What's the reason? I had enough of this business. I'm through. Enough of what business? Helping that guy smuggle them mink skins in. I don't like it. Oh? What made you suddenly decide you didn't like it? Well, because he wanted me to help him bump you off. That's why. I never heard a guy in my life, Mr. And I ain't starting now. He wants to finish you, but I don't want no blood on my hands. Not me. So you're giving yourself up? Yeah, that's it. Huh? Where is your boss? Back at the shank. Listen, he's seen how you found them skins. Oh, he knows we have them, eh? Yeah, and he wants them bad. Bad enough to take a chance on a murder rap to get them. Not me. No, sir. What's your name? Chuck. Chuck Connor. And your boss? Will Ragman. He's plenty tough, mister. He's got ice water in his veins, and he hates government men. That's why he's out to get you. Government men? Why? Oh, so he knows I'm a government agent, eh? Yeah, he knows. Well, Chuck, I think you were wise to quit when you did. Now you can do something for me. Sure. Anything. You can lead me to that shack in the woods. Oh, gosh, Mr. Kent, don't do that. You heard what he said. His boss will shoot you. Don't you worry, Jimmy. He won't get a chance. You and Betsy stay right here and wait for me. Chuck can show me where the shack is, and I'll take care of the rest. Well, I wish you wouldn't do it, Mr. Kent. Why can't we go back to Mulvey and get some cops and bring them here? <laughs> some cops? <laughs> where do you think you are, on Main Street in Metropolis? There aren't any cops in Mulvey. Oh, what about forest rangers or sheriffs or something? Now, don't you worry, Jimmy. I'll be perfectly all right. Now, guarantee to bring Mr. Bull back here with his horns chopped off. Let's go, Chuck. Hey, monsieur, why you do not take the rifle? I won't need it, Betsy. Just you sit tight. I'll be back soon. Ah, uh, this I do not like. I wish he wouldn't take chances like that. Some day he'll be sorry. That is very bad, very bad. Why does he not ask Baptiste to go with him, huh? The crebler with the rifle, Baptiste can shoot the wings off the fly. In all the North Country, there is not one man who can shoot rifle like Baptiste, no. Boom, boom, and this wood he is finished. Maybe you better take the rifle, Baptiste, and follow Mr. Kent. No, no, no. Let's sure he give the order, Baptiste, he's paid to follow the order. Oh, gosh, I'm worried stiff. What if Bull sees him coming and, and just shoots him without warning? It is very bad. Oh, I'm going after Mr. Kent. I won't... Stay where you are, Kent. Oh, who said that? Who? Look, in the back of us. Don't move. Either of you. I got a very nervous finger on the trigger of this rifle. The other one. It's Bull. Oh, so you know my name. That makes it nice and cozy. Stop inching over, Canuck, or I'll drill you full of holes. Hey, you're very brave with rifle. Put down the rifle, but he show you. We'll try that some other time. Right now, I got business to take care of. It's your dogs to the sled. Hey, do not take the order from you. You'll take this order. It's him up. Go ahead, Batiste. You better do as he says. Wait a minute. Let me get that gun out of the sled. Okay, now hitch him up and make it fast. Check I blow for two cents, please, but punch him in the nose. What are you after, mister? You'll find out, kid. Well, you can have the furs if that's what you want. Thanks. That's very generous of you. Anybody ever tell you you got a heart of gold? Come on, Canuck, stop stalling. When you, you move All right, in. kid, get into the sled. Why? Never mind why, get in. Are you Canuck, put that bundle of skins in the sled. Yeah, you heard me. Put him in the sled. I no call promise you. Oh, I see. All of a sudden, you don't understand English. Maybe a little dose of lead will teach you the language. But he's put the furs in. He'll shoot you. You got the right idea, kid. Well, what'll it be? That's better. Dump him in the sled. Okay. Now, both of you get in. You drive, Canuck. I'll walk beside you. And remember, keep them dogs moving slow or I'll empty this rifle into your back. Where are we going? To a nice, quiet spot where you can sit and think it over. All right, turn the sweater on. 
Come on, quit stalling. Okay, now straight ahead. Turn right when you reach that clump of spruce. And don't put that... I got my finger on the trigger. Rendered helpless by the loaded rifle in the hands of the first smuggler, Jimmy and Batiste can do nothing but obey their captor's orders. Walking beside the slow-moving sled, the steel-gray eyes glittering like polished beads, Bull finally calls a halt before the arch entrance to a cave, half hidden under a ledge of rock. All right, pull up here. Get out. You better not try anything with us, mister. Shut up. A kid your size, you got too much to say. Oh, I'm not a kid. I'm going to be... I don't care what you're going to be. Come here, Canuck. Uh, turn around. Hey, what for you wish, buddy? You turn Don't mind what for. Turn around. Uh, okay, now put your hands behind you. I said put your hands behind you. Well That's better. Now a couple of turns of this rope around your wrist. <laughs> Good knot. And you're taken care of. Okay, kid, you're next. You'll be sorry for this. You wait till Clark... Turn around. Turn around. Hands behind your back. Won't need much rope for your skinny wrist. Yeah, that does it. Now, both of you into the cave. Did you hear what I said? Into the cave. Uh, Come on, Batiste. That's far enough. Get down on the floor. On your back. That's just what I like. No argument. You first, Canuck. A little rope around your ankles. A couple of knots. Ah. And you're fixed up. Now, the same for you, kid. There you are. All set for a nice, comfortable rest. Don't waste any time trying to get loose. When Bull Raglan ties a knot, it stays tied. How long are you going to keep us here? Until that wise guy friend of yours, the government man, talks turkey. And maybe that'll be never. So long. Take it easy and you'll last longer. He, he took the sled. Yeah. Uh, I will kill him for take my dog. Don't strain yourself, Batiste. You can't get loose. Sir, uh, why you let him do this one thing? Why you do not allow Batiste to punch him in the nose? Yeah, because he had a gun. He used it without thinking twice. Oh, but don't you worry. When Clark Kent finds out about this, he'll do plenty of punishment. Hey, wait. Monsieur Kent will not know where we are. I do not like this place. Very bad. What do you mean? Uh, you hear this one thing? That is why I say this place very bad. What is it? Bear. Bear? You, you mean a real live bear? Hey, wait. Hey. They are holed up for winter in place like this. You're coming closer, Batiste. What do we do? Batiste, try to get loose the hand. You can't do it. Batiste, I can see his eyes shining in the dark. What do we do? What will Jimmy and Batiste do in the face of this sudden, unexpected danger? Bound hand and foot, they can only wait fearfully as the bear, angered by their presence in the cave, lumbers toward them in the darkness. The situation is tense. With Clark Kent miles away and unaware of what is happening, it looks bad for Jimmy and Batiste. Something is bound to happen, so be sure and listen to the next episode of Superman. Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics Mag- Arriving in the small Venusian settlement of Goldstown for a quiet holiday, Space Cadet 
Tom Corbett, Roger Manning, and Astro found themselves battling a gang of killers who were trying to hijack the entire supply of gold from the neighboring mine. Despite the menace of giant robots, the boys managed to board one of the armed freighters. And in the fight that followed, the gang was beaten. But they escaped with half of their loot in two remaining ships, another freighter, and a space yacht. Fearing they would escape into space, the cadets followed them in the captive freighter still laden with gold. And now, far above Venus, they try to find some trace of the enemy ships. Control X to radar bridge. Check in. Radar bridge, aye. What do you want, Tom? Haven't you picked up those ships on the radar yet, Roger? Look, Tom, I'm good, but I'm not a genius. I just got up here. Give me a chance. Okay, okay, Hotshot. Don't use your tubes. They shouldn't be too far away. We blasted off only 15 minutes after they did. You just hold your rockets, Junior. As soon as I spot them, I'll let you know. In transmission. Hi, Tom. How are we doing? Haven't picked up the trail yet, Astro. How's the power department? Oh, very good for a freighter. There's a power booster gimmick for blast-off that's new to me. Hey, another special gimmick. This is some ship. What do you mean? The space radio they've got. A radio? Hey, have you contacted the Solar Guard? Well, that's just it. We can't. You mean it isn't working? Well, not exactly. Here, the receiver's set for Venusport. Now, listen. But that's just hash. Uh-huh. The set scrambles a regular broadcast into what you heard. And Roger says it's the same way in reverse with the transmitter. When we call the guard, all they hear is a faint normal static, not even annoying enough to check on. Oh, I get it. On the same kind of receiver, the message would be in the clear, huh? Right. Automatic scrambler and descrambler circuits. First I've ever seen. Quite a system, eh, Astro? That gang never had to worry about their messages being intercepted. Cold-blooded killers, and yet they have things like this. To say nothing of the robots. They're going to be tough to lick. Radar bridge control deck, check in. Control deck, I. Find them, Roger. I've got news for you. I've scanned the whole area in front of us and on each side. There are no ships anywhere. What? Those killers have disappeared from space. Oh, great. Don't tell me they have another gimmick. Something that makes them invisible. <laughs> to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment. So stand by. Spaceman, how would you like to have pictures of all your favorite Space Cadets? Well, just listen. Right now at your grocery store, you'll find a picture cutout of one of your favorite Space Cadets on the back of every regular size package of Kellogg's Pep. Now just think, besides getting the best tasting cereal you ever put a spoon to, you get a picture cutout on the back of the package. Say, that's really something. You can get a full-length cutout of Roger Manning, Astro, Tom Corbett, and Dr. Joan Dale. And when you cut each picture out, you can mount them on a stand and put them in a space cadet setting. Draw a picture of the Polaris, and then show Astro climbing up to the power deck. You can show Roger on the radar bridge, and Tom Corbett on the control deck. Each cadet picture shows an official Space Academy uniform, too, even a spacesuit. It's a swell collection, and it's yours with a swell-tasting cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Ask Mom to get Kellogg's Pep at the grocery store. Then have Pep for breakfast every morning. While you're scooping up that swell whole wheat and malt flavor, you can be looking at the space cadets on the back of the package. Then when the box is empty, you're all ready to cut out the picture and set it up. So don't delay. Start your space cadet collection right away. Get a package of the build-up wheat cereal, Kellogg's Pep. P E P. <laughs> Freighter, Tom, Roger, and Astro are confident that they can track down the criminals who brought death and destruction to Gold Town. Until suddenly, Roger reports from the radar bridge that the killers have disappeared from space. That's impossible, Roger. Ships can't just disappear. If you don't believe me, Junior, suppose you get on this radar and check up yourself. Well, all right, all right. Don't overheat your tubes. I know you've been riding that scanner, but if... Well, it's fantastic. Well, they could just be further ahead than we figured, Tom. We're packing all that gold, and there's a lot of inertia to overcome. No, Astro. Their freighter has about the same load. The space yacht could go much faster, but... I got it, well, you guys. If they went twice as fast, they still wouldn't be on a range so quick. Then, with all the scientific gadgets this gang has, maybe... Maybe I was right. That they really can disappear? I doubt that, Astro. We've missed a point somehow. I didn't. There are no ships within radar range. Wait a minute. Sure there are. Only radar can't spot them. 
What are you talking about? Well, there must be some ships flying over Venus right now on regular flights. But with the whole planet behind them, they wouldn't show up on our screen. Naturally not, Junior, but we're talking about ships in space. Are we? Suppose they double back to Venus. But why when they just escaped from there? Because it's the last place anyone would look for them. We didn't, but we'd better start now. Astro, get below and give me power on the steering vanes. We've got to turn this crate around fast. Right. Ready in a minute. You know, Roger, that gang must have a hideaway. Probably they've nearly reached it by now. Yeah, but to cover all of Venus is a big order, Tom. Well, maybe we can pick up something on this radio receiver of theirs. Go on. They wouldn't be stupid enough to use radios. They might. No ordinary set can intercept those scrambled transmissions. And they don't know that we're after them in one of their own ships. By the rings of Saturn, maybe you're right. Come on down here and start sweeping the radio band, Roger, and let's hope we get a break. Well, Tom, getting anything? Not yet, Astro. Roger's been sweeping the whole band, and he's rigged up some instruments to get a fix on any signal. Hey, wait a minute. I think I'm picking up something now. Order to open the entrance to 36. Hey, listen, wait a Take the freighter in first. We will follow. And transmission. That's it. We nearly missed it. I'll say. Sounds like they're ready to duck into their hideout. Did you get a fix, Roger? Not a real one. Impossible without triangulation. All I can show you is the general area on this map of Venus. Let's see now. It's about in this direction. Maybe 50 miles either way. And the distance, well, that could be anywhere from here to, say, uh, here. Great. Jupiter will have to cover about 5,000 square miles. Best I can do, Junior. And it's right in the middle of the worst jungle on Venus. Well, at least we know the area. Maybe we can spot their installation. It, it doesn't look too hopeful, but we have to try. Full space feet, fellas. Let's take a shot at it. <laughs> Inches are there in 5,000 square miles of jungle, Tom? Too many, Roger. There sure are when you have to look over every one of them, even from up here. But you ought to feel at home, Astro. Ah, oh, stow it, Hotshot. To listen to you, anybody think there was nothing on Venus but jungle? If I didn't think so before, I sure do now. Space dust. I'm sick of this, too. Tom, we've covered the whole area without spotting any camouflage for their hideout. We're on the wrong track. Not if the installation is underground, because then nature furnishes the camouflage. Underground? Here? Why not? If they're underground, we can't possibly spot them. We might as well pick up our marbles and go home. No, we can't leave. Do you realize that the gold towners must have contacted the solar guard by now? The guard's probably headed out into space right now for nothing. Yeah, I know. Well, let's get out of here and call them back. Roger, if we leave, the killers will probably pop out and really get away this time. Why should they give up their cozy little nest? Don't you suppose they spotted us prowling around here? They won't figure we're just admiring the scenery. Tom's right. They're probably just waiting for us to beat it so they can make a break. But we can't stay here forever. Our fuel won't hold out. I've been thinking about that, too. If we could only get them to come out while we're still here. Bad chance. Well, there's only one thing left. You work your great brain while Astro and I work over the radio. Yeah, we can try to change those scrambling circuits so we can call the guard. Think you can get it done in time? No, but at least we'll be doing something. Well, go ahead. No, don't touch it. Watch it, Astro. The boy's gone space happy. The radio, that's it. That's the way to get those snakes out of their hole. What do you mean, Tom? Look, we know we can't contact the solar guard on this trick set, but the gangsters don't know we know it. You follow me? Yeah, what about it? Well, if I pretend I'm trying to call the guard and slip in some information to interest the killers, they'll hear it and come out with a ship. How do you know they'll hear it? I don't, but I imagine they're listening. And what's this information that's so interesting? Just listen. Turn on the set, Roger. Solar Guard Headquarters from Space Cadet Tom Corbett. Come in, please. Solar Guard from Cadet Corbett. Acknowledge. We still can't hear your answer, but assume you can hear us. I request emergency priority on the following message. We have located the Gold Town criminals in Venus Sector 92 Southwest and are patrolling the area. Please send help immediately. Repeat, immediately. Our position is dangerous. We have a full cargo of gold aboard and all gun controls are jammed. Come at once. End transmission. Well, that does it, fellas. I hope. Hey, what was that about our gun controls being jammed? That was the clincher, Astro. If those yellow space rats think we're helpless, they should walk into our trap. And we're the bait, huh? Right. But sometimes a trap doesn't go off. And then the bait gets eaten. Tom, 
Tom, Roger. Take a look through this viewport. What's the matter? Something mighty funny. Way over there, a whole section of jungle is sinking. The underground entrance. It worked. They're coming out. There's a ship blasting off. Hey, it's the space yacht. Good, I hoped it would be. Yeah, that yacht can run circles around this tug. But we have more firepower. And they think we don't have any. Don't worry, Roger. Who's worried? Great galaxy. The freighter's coming out, too. Uh Uh-oh, now I am worried. I didn't think they'd use the ship with the gold. Looks as if they've managed to unload it somehow. It's making good time. We've still got our cargo. That means even the freighter can outrun and outmaneuver us, Tom. Yes, I'd better change our course. Look as if we're making a run for it, so they don't suspect our guns are really working. I'd better get below and start nursing the rocket. Okay, Astro. One thing we'll need is plenty of power. Go get it, Tom. The yacht's drawn way ahead of the freighter now. Well, that won't do. We'll have to get them together. But if we could pick off the yacht first, then the then freighter... the freighter would know our guns are working. I want it to come as a little surprise to both of them. Okay, Tom. All right, buddy. Right, Astro. Full space speed. All right. Full space speed. <laughs> They saw us move. We're still out of range, though. We won't be for long. Are they climbing after us? Sure, and their rate of climb is faster. Power deck. Power deck, all right. Stand by steering rockets, Astro. Two turns to port, as sharp as this ship can make. Then we'll be heading back where we came from. That's the idea. Get ready. The yacht's coming on range now. Catching up fast. And now's the time. Okay, Astro. Short blast for first turn. Coming up. This is like turning a barge. All right, let's throw again. Okay. Coming up. Come on, baby. Get around. Roger, where's the yacht? A little above and behind us. Pretty close. All right, I'm a freighter. That was her getting into the act. We'd better get on the starboard gun. I'll take them. You take the port side. The yacht will be there in any second. But don't fire yet. Wow, that one rocked us. What are you waiting for, Tom? See the whites of their eyes? Almost. I'm cutting right between them. We can fire from both sides. Great idea. If they don't get us first. Coming up. You ready? Sure. Um... Hey, the yacht's starting to die. Okay, open fire. <laughs> Blast it, miss. I nailed the freighter to stern. She's down to our speed now. Tom, look, they're sending robots after us. Uh, a robot shouldn't be able to hurt a ship this size. Don't bother with them unless they fly straight into a gun. Okay. The yacht's coming back and the freight is turning. They're going to try and finish us. They've got us bracketed. Astro, give me a blast. Okay. Hey, Tom the robot. What in space was that? Astro, the rockets are stopped. What happened? I had to shut them off. The gang sent a robot square into the rocket tube. Jam it there. If I held power, we'd blow up. The galaxy without power, we can't maneuver. We can't even stay in the air. The clobber us. Keep firing, Roger. Okay. Astro, come up and help him. We'll have to take the ship in for a crash landing. Roger. Astro, are you all right? Yeah, I'm okay, Tom. Me too, I guess. Pretty good landing, Tom. I was lucky to find a clear spot in this jungle. Except that they'll be able to spot us here. They have. They're following us down. Oh, blasted. Look at our guns. They're wrecked. We can't fire back. Well, there's nothing left to fire anyway, Tom. What? We're out of ammunition. Oh, but a couple of warheads. All right. We'll have to get out and hide in the jungle. The ship's healed over on the main hatch, so we'll use the emergency. Come on, hurry up. But, Tom, the jungle's hopeless. We'll die there, even if the killers don't come after us. It's better than this. Go on, Tom. Open the hatch. We're doing I can't. It's jammed. Oh, great. And there's no other way out. What about the rocket tube? That's blocked by the robot. Those space crawlers really have us now. We're flat. We'll return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment. So stand by. Stand by, all spacemen. Stand by, all spacemen. Here's a special teleceiver message for all spacemen from Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Hi there. A lot of you spacemen have been writing in asking for pictures. Pictures of Dr. Dale, Astro, Roger, and myself. Well, the Kellogg people heard about all this, so just listen to what they did. 
They put pictures of all of us right on different packages of Kellogg's Pep. And not only that, but the pictures are put on so you can cut them out and stand them up. But these swell picture cutouts are only part of it. The whole Pep package is new. As a matter of fact, all the Kellogg's cereals are dressed up in bright new packages. No fooling. Every single one of them. Wait till you see the big lineup of all your Kellogg favorites at your grocery store. The best tasting cereals. The best looking packages. And every one of them Kellogg's. That's right, spaceman. It's K-Day at the grocery store. All the Kellogg cereals have new faces, new pictures, new exciting packages. Why, people are even singing about it. Did you see what I saw? Kellogg's on display. In brand new boxes, bright and gay, these famous cereals come your way. Go see this eyeful. The Kellogg's All-Star Breakfast Show has a cheerful look, a lift for you. Starts you up with a hoop to do. Kellogg's for breakfast and a happy, happy day. Get a big supply today, today. Yes, for a happy day, have a happy breakfast with a best-tasting cereal ever, Kellogg's. Trapped in the battered wreckage of their ship after crash landing in the Venusian jungle, Tom, Roger, and Astro are unable to return their enemy's fire. With every exit sealed by the crash, they face certain death as warheads burst all around and the killers come roaring down out of the sky. This is a great way for us to wind up like rats in a trap. We're not finished yet, Roger. There's no way out. Tom, those dirty space crawlers are going to blow us to space dust. Maybe not. Come on, this way. Run. Where are we headed for? For the cargo section. Where the gold is stored. What good is that? There's no hatch there. I know. Here. Go on in. Fast. Okay, here we are. So what? Look, through this viewport, the up and the plane have almost reached the ground. How could they miss if they really wanted to blow up the ship? Maybe they're just playing games. No, they want to kill us, all right. But not by blowing everything sky high, including the gold. They figure blasts and fragments from the warheads will do it. Well, they're right. But here, with the gold, we have a chance. The bags of dust will protect us for a while. Tom, what's the difference? We're still trapped. But maybe we won't be. The same gold that helps us must be tearing the ship apart. Tearing the... What are you talking about? Well, look how all that weight has shifted. It's bearing down on a bulkhead that's already been weakened by the crash. And now with those warheads blasting all around us, something has to give. The whole place. Yeah, you're right, Tom. They're buckling. And they've sprung a seam over here. It's only an inch. Brother, that was a bad one. No, a good one. The seam's wide open. There's our exit. And on the side, away from the gang. They'll never see it through all the smoke and dust. Okay, let's go. Even that jungle looks good to me now. Go ahead. Hurry. I'll be with you as fast as I can. Huh? You're not staying here, are you? Yeah. There's something else to do. But Tom, the killers are landing. Don't argue. Get it going. Okay, it's your war. Come on, Astro. I'll join you soon. I hope. Why doesn't Tom come? How long have we been waiting here? I don't know, Astro. Five minutes, ten. Seems like hours. Even the freighter's landed now. And neither ship is even bothering to fire anymore. Well, why should they? They're sure we're dead. But they're sending the robots in first, just in case. Roger, maybe Tom really is dead? Yeah, hurt anyway. With those big torches, the robots are cutting through the hull like butter. They'll be inside the ship in a second. Tom won't have a chance. We have to go after it. We won't have a chance either, but... Oh, let's go. Wait, Roger! Let's go! Tom, Tom, you're all right. We thought you were... I'll tell you later. Hit the dirt fast. What's the matter? They spot you now. Fly flat and dig yourself in as much as you can. But what for? No time to explain. The robots are in the ship now. What difference does it make? Hey, what was that? They can't be fired. Get your heads down! Great Jupiter. What happened, Tom? Take a look. The ship we were in, it's blown up. Robots and men scattered like toys. Tom, what in the universe did you do? Tell you later. First, let's make sure those space crawlers are licked. Once and for all. Well, this is one bunch of killers that won't do any killing anymore. Most of them won't even wake up until they're in a prison hospital. And some won't ever wake up. Yes, the ones who were too anxious to get at the gold they'd murdered for. Speaking of gold, Tom, 
I've heard of men rich enough to throw a little around. But I bet you're the first who ever scattered a whole shipload. <laughs> Will you tell us now what you did? Oh, it was simple enough. I just rigged up a, well, I guess you'd call it an atomic booby trap. Booby trap? Uh-huh. I dismantled the last two warheads, fixed them so the robots would set them off when they got to the power deck. That was the first explosion. And it triggered the reactor pile. I pulled out the dampers before I left. So the whole pile went. Mm-hmm. Wow, you sure did a job, Tom. Good, Junior. Couldn't have done better myself. Yo, why, you couldn't even do half our gas, Astro. Come on, let's see if one of those ships can still get off the ground. I hope so. I'd sure like to get out of here. Yep. Get this finished up and then back to Gold Town. You think your uncle will still take us on that fishing trip? Sure, just wait till you tie into those Venusian mutations, Sam. It sounds like real sport. Hey, you're not kidding. Are those sound of them? Jupiter, how can you two think about anything as dull as fishing at a time like this? Dull? Why, Roger, there's nothing in the universe more exciting than having a fighting fish at the end of your line. Right, Astro? Sure, that's one time you really know you're in a scrap. With a fish, huh? Well, that kind of talk after all this excitement certainly proves what I always said. You guys are crazier than a Martian platypus with two-headed fleas. Don't miss the next action-packed adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, on Tuesday, when the crew of the Polaris returns from Venus, only to find themselves threatened with death as they try to solve... The Riddle of Astro. Tune in, same time, same station on Tuesday for the next thrilling interplanetary adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Brought to you by Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal. Corbett Space Cadet, starring Frankie Thomas, can also be seen on television and appears in the comic sections of many of America's leading newspapers. Look for it daily and in weekend editions. Featured in today's cast were Jan Merlin and Al Markham. Today's program was written by Don Hughes, directed by Drex Hines. Jackson Beck speaking. Kellogg's Raisin Bran has a secret. Kellogg's Raisin Bran has a secret. And what a secret. In Kellogg's Raisin Bran, the tasty raisins are dipped in honeycomb. That means plumper, more tender raisins, along with delicious golden crisp bran flakes. Both fruit and cereal, all in one box. And no other raisin bran but Kellogg's gives you the tender goodness of raisins dipped in honeycomb. That's Kellogg's secret. So for your breakfast, make sure you get Kellogg's, because... Kellogg's Raisin Plan has a secret. This program came to you from New York. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Western York, and an exciting story about the most murderous group of men on earth, as Anthony Ellis tells it in A Bullet for Mr. Smith. I've been asked to take the job because of the freelance correspondent in Europe. I could travel anywhere and talk to anybody without arousing suspicion. I would be working for the French intelligence office. And since I was unmistakably American, we hoped that enemy agents would be slow to discover me as a danger to them. Five days after I accepted the job, I was told to go to a little movie on the left bank in Paris where I would make my first contact. I went, bought a ticket, 
found my way to the 15th row, fourth seat from the aisle. Tell me the time. You can't. Oh. <laughs> Nine o'clock, monsieur. Nine. Exactly. Nine. Exactly. The men were looking for Clayton South Street. They may be English, but they don't think so. We don't know. We were from Paris two days ago, but we had an idea who said it for Christmas. And the description, well, I knew that. About six foot, 180 pounds. No time to look back on that one. Okay. There is a tobacco shop in the village of Javon. It's in the fifth quarter. On the front of the month, one of our men. Better go there. Yet, come here. Kill him if you're out there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Concerned the plans of one of Western Europe's greatest defenses against invasion, the new rocket bases in France. Somebody had gained access to all the details of those rocket bases, but it remained to find out who, and then to stop them before he could get them out of the country. By midnight, I was on my way to the Swiss border. The next afternoon, I reached the run and found the tobacco shop of my contact, Mark. Certainly. Any luck, Margaret? I'm afraid not. 
I'm telling. I, uh, I just remembered. Jim Murray, was it not? There may be some in the back room. <laughs>
Lee wanted me out of the way. Yet I was pretty sure she didn't know what I was asking. I was trying to make it add up when Mr. Smith came back. I feel perfectly skeptic about this, and I'm afraid I would have drawn it off to our old man. Oh, it's too bad. We have some other time, hmm? Uh, a frightful bother, but that telephone was out of urgent. And Mary, the uh, matter we spoke of earlier. Oh, yes. Do think of it, Roger. Oh. All right, forget it. Maybe we can get together tomorrow. Yes, Roger. Hey, come on up, my dear. Goodbye. I'll see you later. Oh, uh, uh, please forget what I said before. <laughs> I was only trying to be romantic. Sure, I know. You've been reading too much Eric Ambler and John Buckham. Eyes and stuff. Goodbye, Mr. Rogers. Goodbye. Oh, we're on the news. Mom had said that they didn't have the plans yet. It could mean that Mr. Smith and his girlfriend were expecting to get them tonight. I followed them out to the lobby, watched them go upstairs, then sat. elevator together and left the Grand Hotel. I followed. It wasn't hard, but we headed straight for the New York Railroad Station. Hey, Steve. Hey, a couple of friends of mine are taking the train tonight. They just bought tickets. A tall Englishman and a pretty girl. So, oh, yes, of course, to Basel. They're going to be number six. You are seeing them off? No. I'm going with them. I stayed out of sight behind the garden car, waiting for the train to pull in. And Mr. Smith and Mary Donnelly walked up and down the platform. It was a couple of nice tours during the sights of the earth. Then a man came along. Smith shook hands with him. He went on walking. When they passed me, I got my first good look at the train here. Something familiar. Something. Took a few seconds to register. The man we are looking for just inside Smith. He may be English, but we don't think so. About six feet, 180 pounds. Dark, snow triangular style, and such a look. Then I remembered. This man on the platform fitted the description the French intelligence office had given me in Paris, even to the triangular star on his lips. I had found myself another Mr. Smith. Escape under the direction of Norman McDonald returns in just a moment. The Trojan horse worked out pretty well. It got the Greeks into the walls of Troy so they could take the city. Well, false ideas can be used the same way. We're being invaded, so to speak, when we get hold of mere scraps of information or depend upon just part of the truth. Actually, there's very little difficulty in finding out for yourself what's right and what's wrong. All you have to do is keep well informed. And you have the advantage of the greatest and most accurate news sources in the world. The American techniques of gathering news, of culling the truth from the thought. You'll find all the right information by following the newspapers, the magazines, the books, by listening to newscasts and radio roundtable discussions on vital subjects. They're all available to you. Find out the whys and the wherefores. You'll be glad you did. And you'll be a better serviceman and a better citizen. And true, remember, the more you know, the higher you go. It's as simple as that. And now, back to Escape. <laughs> Certainly, the Smiths 1 and 2 were in possession of the rocket based plan. The fact that they were headed for Basel told me that. Just across the Swiss border was Laura in Germany. That's a matter of six or seven miles from Basel. Once inside Germany, it would be easy going for them to point Z. I had to stop them before we got to Basel. I was on a Swiss train, and the Swiss are the most neutral people in the world. They can get real stuff about their neutrality. I knew I couldn't get anywhere trying to hide, so I went to the lounge car to let them know I was aboard. 
Mary Donnelly was sitting in an armchair looking out into the darkness. Hi. What are you doing here? Come to Barbara. I... I know, I know. Let, let's say I'm, I'm romantic. It would have been very dull and mean without you there. I don't believe you. Um, thank you, Mr. Smith. Get me wrong. Well, they didn't teach you much about manners at Bennington, did they? Manners? Nothing. I think they should be glad to see me. I'm confused. If they know where you are, they're up. They're what? I can't understand. Mr. Smith, isn't what you think? Really? Are you not believing me? It's serious. So I think you're following me. I am. You... Well, I'm following you, too. Oh, what's that? Well, well, Mr. Roger. Mary, you didn't go quiet, Mr. Smith. Quiet. Um, I'd like you to meet Mr. Corey. Mr. Corey? Yes, Mr. Corey. Oh, Mr. Corey. 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 Mr. I didn't, did I? Well, I'll order at the bar. Is uh, Johnny Walker all right? Fine. I'll go with you. I like my drink just so. Let's come with you. All right. I'm sorry. Now you're coming to me. I'm No. You are. No. Just working for a country like you. They know it too. I didn't think my being here would fool us along. I'm still with you. Oh, uh, that's worth trying? Yeah, it takes some explaining. That was a chapter on Gary. That was a in Like the others? Like the tobacconist that you've won? I did. I was there in the back room. You knew I was all the time. I knew what you are, too. What's the matter? You're homesick? Where are you going? I don't know anywhere. I can't stand it. You might try jumping off the train. It'll be quicker than a long trial. You're going to faint. You got hold of the stuff and ran down the car. I sat back and waited for the drink. It was going to be part of the game from here on. They knew, and I knew. And the question now seemed to be who carried the stolen plan? Smith? Carl Keith? It was Carl Keith, really Smith. <laughs> it was beginning to sound like a who's on first to the team when the Scotch and the Soda arrived. Well, here we are. Uh, thanks a lot. Where's Miss Donnelly? Hmm? Oh, she. I don't think he felt too well. Must have gone to her compartment. Father Sutton, wasn't it? Must have been. Look here. Why don't we all go to my compartment? That's a wonderful call, Chief. We can play some cards. I imagine the poker's your game, eh, Mr. Rogers? It's a good game. Not tonight. Oh, but you must. I mean, well, we can hardly take no for an answer. No, no. I don't feel like it. Compartments are stuffy, huh? I stay out of them as much as possible. This won't do at all. I mean, three is such a good game. Well, Mr. Rogers, you know what this is in my pocket? Pipe? Mm-hmm. Try again. Done. Well done, Mr. Rogers. Come on. Um, aren't you afraid of my go off? I got a noise. The conductor down there might wonder. Mm-hmm. Yes, I do, huh? Perhaps Mr. Rogers will join us later. I'm sure he will. I had one that round. My father bluffed me and I lost out. But that still hadn't got me closer to what I was after. So I finished my drink, had another in. Then I went to Mary Donnelly's compartment. I don't want to talk to you. I bet you don't. Open up or I'll break the door in. Mr. Smith is in the next compartment. Okay, be quiet. Can you get in? Is there an adjoining door? Yes, but it's locked. What's the matter? Would you trust them? They're under with me. You think I have something to do with their being here? Well, that comes. You don't mean that. You don't know what they like. I've got a rough idea. So did Mark. I couldn't help. I 
did he wanted to put the gun? Why did he go to this one? He said he wanted some cigarettes and special gun. They didn't have them in the end. Go on. Later, Mr. Smith told me that. They found out that the defense agent in Brazil knew about it. He said he had to kill him. He was so close to getting the plan of nothing to do with fear. Which one is the real Mr. Smith? Oh, Chief. I don't know. Are there others? No. Yes. It's a code name. Okay. Doesn't matter then. You've got the plan. I don't know. Who are you crossing into Germany? Laura? I didn't want to go. I, I didn't know what they were lying. Well, now you know. I was just sitting in the school in the college. We used to sit up close and close and play with the markers. Yeah, I said, no. Oh, sure, honey. You didn't know they told me you luck. Well, it's an editor. I was so... I was so... I was wrong. I was wrong. You sure were. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You expect me to believe that? Yes. I, I don't know what I can do, but trust me. I, I have to get the police back. You know what it means if they find out? I know. I want to help you. And it's not me you're helping. It's a lot of other people you don't even know. Okay. Come on. Next two, Roger. Yes. Oh, 
ready to roll out from under just to come and off. Now I got my arm around Smith back in heaven against me as a shield, my back to the wall. Now, Mr. Arthur, let go of him. You'll feel it. And you know it. Sure. Sure. You can have him. I'll take my gun. I'll open the door, Mr. Forge. You've got to make complaining to do. Nothing to do for Mary Donnelly. She'd been hit when the gun went off. I'd like to have told her that everything was okay, but I bet she knew it. I'd like to say that in the reporter family would never know what the least I could do. The Swiss authorities in Basel were tough. They had Smith and Carl Keith for murder. Me? Well, I was an innocent bystander. They let me go. I went back to Paris with a newspaper under my arm. My job was finished, and I turned it over to the country to hire me. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you a bullet for Mr. Smith by Anthony Ellis. John Daniel was starred as Alan Rogers, with Gene Bates as Mary Donnelly, and Ben White as Mr. Smith. Featured in the cast were Larry Dubkin, Harry Bartell, Edgar Barrier, and Jack Crucian. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Daryl Castillo. <laughs> You've been listening to Escape, adaptations of the world's finest tales of adventure and mystery. Escape comes to you each week at the same time through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. And good hot roasting present Space Patrol. I adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space, visions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander in Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are bound securely in a robot ship headed toward Terra and controlled by Prince Baccarati from his castle on Planet X. Can't move, sir. Even without the paralyzer array, the straps could hold us. Keep struggling, Happy. Pluto Defense Squadron 12 Space Patrol, a private cruiser, MPC 307 Neptune Registry. Acknowledge. He's calling this ship. We have information that Prince Baccarati is aboard. Surrender immediately. Yes, I can only get loose to reach that space phone. Major Roberts in the Baccarati. Acknowledge or we'll fire. Oh, if we could only let him know that we're aboard. He's fighting half. Hey, they're firing at us. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting space patrol adventure, Escape from Planet X. All right, step right up, test your strength, test your swing, ring the bell, and win a prize. Hi, gang, this is Captain Dick Tufel. And Space Patroller Bill O'Connell. We're having a whale of a time today at the Terrace State Fair. 
My pal here says he's going to ring that bell and win the prize. You bet I am, Captain Tussauds. All right, there he goes. He's raising the mallet over his head. Up it goes. Down it comes. Man, oh man, oh man. Just listen to that bell ring. But power and strength. Hey, Space Patroller, how'd you get all that get up and go? Supercharged, that's me. I had my bite-sized checks today. Now, Space Patrollers, how about you? Did you start off this morning with a big bowl full of ripe checks or wheat checks? Those super cereals that help to supercharge you? Bite-sized wheat checks. Rich, hearty, shredded wheat. Chock full of flavor, minerals, and energy vitamins. Yes, and no other cereal, flakes or pots, contains so much nourishment in such concentrated bite-sized form. That's why Commander Corey made rice checks and wheat checks official cereals of the Space Patrol. So, gang, tomorrow morning and every morning, be a real Space Patroller. Power up with an energy-packed bowl full of rice checks and wheat checks. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, Escape from Planet X. The power-mad Prince Baccarati is now in the hands of Commander Corey. The man who sought to overthrow the United Planet is a captive on the remote planet X and the very prison camp where he had forced 130 abducted men into slave labor in the Arctite mines. How could that happy assist space patrol officers preparing to evacuate Baccarati's former captives to their home planet? Commander Corey questions the self-styled prince in the labor camp office shack. You might as well tell the truth, Baccarati. How many United Planet citizens are you holding in other parts of planet X? Surely, Commander. You know how many men and women are missing from the solar system? Yes, but I want to know how many are on this planet right now. I want them all released. Look, Corey, you have only two spaceships here. In less than an hour, Malengo will have alerted a squadron of my ships at the castle. They can easily prevent you from blasting off. Your men aren't going to risk destroying you. And Malengo knows that you're in custody. Remember, my forces are still in control at Penetech. You and your men will never leave here unless you release me. The only thing delaying our blast off is a last-minute search for those two men who escaped from your prison camp just before our ships arrived. The minute they're rescued, I'm giving the order to blast off, and you're coming with us. And they won't be found so easy, sir. A lot could happen to them in the Valley of Dread. Whether we find them dead or alive, they'll still be witnesses against you. Excuse me, Commander. Oh, yes, sir. Those two men who escaped have been found, sir. Are they all right? It's pretty fair, sir. They recognized our space patrol ships and came back to camp under their own power. Good. And then accounts for all of Baccarati's captives, all 130 of them. Yes, sir. Except that the last tally shows 131. Well, that's one more than we're supposed to have. Well, space Sergeant Deckens is sure the count is correct, sir. Well, I'll check on it later. How's the evacuation proceeding? Well, very good, sir. Most of the sick men are aboard ship number one, and Baccarati's guards are locked up in number two. I'll order a complete search of the camp to see that none of Baccarati's men are hiding. And we'll put Baccarati aboard and blast off the terror. Meanwhile, we'll just lock his highness in this room so he won't be. Both ships are loaded, Commander. Oh, fine, Happy. We can blast off as soon as we put Baccarati aboard. Mm. I'll sure be glad to get off this planet. It's ugly enough ordinarily, but look at those clouds. Mm. Storm is moving in from the east. Well, we'll be gone in five minutes. When we get Baccarati on Terra, we can give him a brainograph test. We might find a weak point in his defenses at the castle. And at the same time, how many prisoners he has in front of us. Well, a couple of the older men don't agree with that last tally, sir. Uh, they said they privately kept Tab and their fellow prisoners, and, you know, there were just 130. Oh, the Tab and is very reliable. If he counted 131, there must be a um... Happy, come on, hurry. What is it, sir? Get to the office building quickly. It just occurred to me where that extra man came from. Commander, look. I was afraid of that. The door's been forced open. The rocket fucker body's gone. How did he get out of that room? Look at the lock. It was smashed from this side. Yeah, but who... That extra a... man. One of Baccarati's guards managed to slip in with the evacuee. He must be somewhere in the camp. If we hurry, we can catch him. Into the yard, quickly. There's Baccarati's atmosphere ship. Maybe they headed for that. I don't think so. He knows it's the first place we've left. We'll never be able to blast off with our ships here. Oh, then they must be outside the camp, heading toward the mountains. With a dozen men from our ship, we could overtake them. Now, the important thing right now is to get these ships off Planet X before Baccarati's outlaws show up. I hate to let him go when we finally had our hands on him. I don't know how you feel, Happy, but the ships are in real danger now. Chances are Baccarati had the foresight to grab a miniature space upon when he got loose. 
He can tip off the Langro that he's no longer a prisoner. Yeah, and the whole squadron can tear after our ships without worrying about hurting Baccarat. I'm giving the order for our ship to blast off immediately. You and I will stay here and find out X and search for Baccarat. A few moments later, two men scramble through the thick bush on the steep side of the mountain near the prison camp. One of the men is in the ragged, faded red uniform of the prison workers. The other is Prince Baccarati, his gaudy tunic torn by the brambles. All right, all right. Let's stop. It's me. I'm winded. We'll rest a minute while I contact Malengo. Then we'll move on. Hand me that mirror, please, please. Okay. Yes, Your Highness. Oh, uh, by the way. That was very clever of your touch, mingling with the prisoners in the hospital, sir. You will be rewarded when we return to the castle. Thank you, Your Highness. That was an poor ship blasting off. I suppose he decided not to risk losing boat ships by keeping them here while he looked for me. Yeah. I might have known it. Known what? That Corey would think of the safety of his man. Yes, and perhaps of his own safety, too. He knows he couldn't fight off my ship, so he blasted off. Yes, but he'll be back. We'll be ready for him when he returns. We'll have that warning tower back in operation, and if a space patrol ship comes within a million deals of this planet, we'll blast it to ashes. Hey, Highness, how are your men going to find us in this storm? Uh, we can... Uh, before we run, we can go back to the prison camp... Atmosphere should be there. Yes, but Corey probably put it out of commission before he blasted off. Probably. But at least we'll be out of this storm. Come on, Osa. Let's head down the mountain. As the storm builds in violence, Bosnati stand in the darkened office shack, looking out the window toward Baccarati's small, sleek atmosphere ship. An occasional flash of lightning brings every inch of the prison yard into full brilliance. It's got away, all right. Well, they must have, Harper. There's no way Malango could have detected them on this side of the planet. All right, let's go. Run for the ship. Yes, sir. Wow, what a blast. It's a regular hurricane. Keep your head down. Buck the wind. Up the ladder into the ship. Close it, Harper. For a minute, I thought the wind was going to blow me clear out of the stockade. Planet X. Even the weather is terrible. Yeah, it's a break for us. We can circle over this whole area without being seen or heard. And then Baccarati signals to a ship to know where he is. Can we fight off a whole fleet of Baccarati ships in this little atmosphere job? We won't have to, Hack. Fact is, our only one of us that we land to pick up on the other. They won't be expecting any company. Yeah. And the fact that this is Baccarati's own ship is going to throw them off guard uh, when they do see us. We're going to have to work fast and hope that our luck goes on. All right, Hap, let's get these ship airborne. Yes, sir. Stay right where you are, gentlemen. I got a flux gun on you. Get your hands up, Corey. Or take their weapons. Yes, Your Highness. Oh, Baccarati and the missing guard. Get the guard, Hap. Corey! I warned you! I got Corey, Orca. Break away from the cadet. Sure. Oh! <laughs> That sure sent him spinning, Your Highness. Drag them back aft and lock them out. I'll notify Malengo to prepare a cell for them in the dungeon of my castle. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. This is Dick Tufel speaking from Edwards Air Force Base, Murak, California. I've got an interesting story for you this morning about one of the most unusual-looking planes in the sky today, the XF-92A, designed by Convair Aircraft, San Diego. Now, in just a second, I'm going to introduce you to the Air Force test pilot on that plane, Major Chuck Yeager, the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound. He's standing beside me right now, but first, I'd like to tell you a few things about the XF-92A. It looks exactly like a triangle. It's often called the flying triangle. Wings are struck back at a severe angle, 60 degrees. Now, top speed of this Air Force interceptor is about 700 miles an hour. Surface ceiling is over 45,000 feet. You know, it takes some doing to test fly a ship like that. You need energy and plenty of it. And to face the risk involved, you need steady nerves. Now, let's hear what a real test pilot has to say about it. 
Meet Chuck Yeager. Let me tell you what it takes to be a test pilot. To start with, I have to be in good condition. That means get plenty of rest, plenty of exercise, good food at every meal. For breakfast, I like a cereal that really tastes good and has plenty of energy. You like rice checks and wheat checks, eh, Chuck? Well, no other cereal, pops or flakes, contains so much nourishment in such concentrated bite-sized form. So, gang, do as famous test pilots do. Pick your cereal for flavor and energy. Today, get rice checks and wheat checks. <laughs> And now back to Escape from Planet X. Believing that Prince Baccarati was hiding in the mountains near his slave labor camp, Commander Corey and Cadet Hattie boarded Baccarati's atmosphere ship. Buzz had counted on the violent storm raging in this part of Planet X to conceal the ship and enable them to recapture the crafty prince. But Baccarati and his guard had returned to the camp, thinking Buzz had left with the evacuees in the space patrol ship. Just as Buzz and Happy were about to blast off, Baccarati and his guards stepped out and overpowered the two space patrolmen with a flux gun. Right now, Buzz and Happy are in a cell in the dungeon of Baccarati's castle on the opposite side of Panadex. The prince taunts them through the bars. Ah, the great commendatory. Oh, I hate to tear myself away. Don't let us detain you, Baccarati. Oh, you're very kind. Uh, perhaps you'd like to know where I am going. I am going to Terra. I'll go in ordinary clothes as a businessman from Neptune. I'll arrive in a private cruiser with a Neptune registry. Aren't you afraid your noble bearing will give you away? Uh, not at all, Commander. The space patrol is certain that I'm here on planet Earth. Trying to avoid being captured. Are you? They will be making plans to sneak back here and get you off the planet. The last thing they would suspect is that Prince Baccarati would dare to show up in the capital of the United Planet. Oh, and they have a point. Yeah. And I have aged in the planet. And on the other side. All the time, they're working on my plans to overthrow the government. Preparing the way for my return to the solar system as a supreme ruler. Oh. You didn't know that, did you, Prince? About my age. I suspect it. I think this is the time to confer with them and to make arrangements for certain materials and supplies to be brought here to planet X. Ah. I see that you figure out the texture district. What makes you so sure you want? Because you are here in my castle as a hostage. In case I am caught, your safety will be the terms of my release. Well, goodbye, Commander. I don't know. Agents, I tell you. And the space patrol hasn't got the faintest idea who they are. Oh, can Baccarati get away with it? Go to Terra? Oh, I'm bold enough. I didn't expect it. And here we are, locked up in this dungeon. Yeah. What is it? There's something shining out there in the corridor. See it through the bar? Hmm? Oh. Oh, it is gone. Oh, it looks like a key. I thought I heard a kind of key just as Baccarati was in there. Oh, but they think it reached that key. I don't know what's watching me. God, it might as well be back on Baccarati's belt. Hey, wait a minute. Take off your belt. Quickly. Yes, sir. Put the buckle out there to the key. Maybe you can hook it and drag it over to the door. All right, sir. Here it goes. Be careful. Don't knock it far away. Over the key, sir. Okay, it's there. Coming. Yeah. Now I can get it with my hand. Uh, there you are, sir. Well, let's hope it's the right key. I can reach around with a lock. It's hard to turn. I can't get any leverage. Yeah. That did it. We're free. But we're still in the castle. Our best bet is to try to locate a space patrol and tip off the space patrol that Fox Roddy's on his way. Come on. Cautiously, Buzz and Happy make their way down the dungeon corridor. Two guards, joking together at a turn in the passage, fail to notice the two space patrolmen as they creep up the stairs to the next level. Carefully, Buzz tries door after door. 
Then, finally, he finds what he's searching for. A storeroom full of electronic equipment. Swiftly with Happy's aid, the commander adjusts the dials of a spacophone to the secret space patrol frequency and... Secret space patrol frequency and turns on the transmitter. I could set each of his bars of space station outside the Pluto orbit within luck. Emergency. Mandatory on Planet X calling all space patrol units. Corey to all space patrol units. Emergency. Space station three Pluto orbit to Commander Corey. Your signal's very weak, Commander. Now listen carefully. I can't repeat this message. Prince Baccarati is preparing to fly to Terra in a private space cruiser of Neptune Registry. He will pose as a legitimate businessman. Alert all units to intercept him outside the perimeter of his planet X defenses. Take him alive if possible. Hurry up. You shouldn't have any trouble picking up Baccarati. No. There won't be any other ships coming from the direction of planet X. Now, half our next problem is to get back to our cell without being seen. Uh, back to the cell? Yes. Yeah. Baccarati mustn't know that we've had a chance to tip off the space before. Even now, we have not Carefully retrace their steps and at last reach the dungeon level under the castle. A moment later, they're in the cell with the door locked. We had the key somewhere in the cell, huh, in case we need to use it again. Yes, sir. I made it just in time, somebody came. Okay. They're looking for his car. I got good news for you, gentlemen. I know. You got a toothache. That was unkind, Cadet. You should be grateful to me. Come on. You're leaving Planet X. We are? Where are you taking us? I am putting you in a robot ship and sending you to a town. Well, at last you're showing some sense, Baccarani. Yes, I know. Oh, uh, incidentally, you can see that key you found on the floor. As you see, I have a duplicate. Uh, Key? Yes. The key with which you unlocked your cell. Uh, by the way, I overheard your conversation on the space phone, the space patrol. You found the equipment sooner than I expected. So you planted the key there, dropped it on purpose. That's right. Just far enough out of reach to look at the dental, but near enough so that you would use your famous ingenuity and recover it. I don't get it, so... Why would you want us to, to tip off the space patrol about your trip to China? Because Bacarati had no intention of going to China. <laughs> That's right, Commander. It's too bad you didn't figure that out sooner. And the space patrol challenges a certain private cruiser with Neptune registry and receives no answer. They will start firing on it. You will be helpless, unable to call up your men. And in their eagerness to get Prince Bacarati, the space patrol will destroy their own commander-in-chief. A few moments later, Buzz and Happy are strapped securely in the control cabin of the robot space cruiser. As an added precaution, Prince Baccarati gives them each a blast with a paralyzer ray, then returns to the tower of his castle to regulate the remote control equipment of the robot ship. Can you talk to me? I can't move. Even without that paralyzer ray, he's strapped with holes. I'm sure he's taking any chance. All right, here we go. Blasting the ship off a remote control from the castle. Are you comfortable, gentlemen? Oh, don't bother, Spencer, because I can't hear you. It's fortunate. I don't think your remarks would be complimentary. Yeah, he's right, Mr. Right. I'll give you something to think about, Commander, on your final journey. Shortly after your space patrol went back to the pit. There will be another tragedy in another part of space. What are you talking about, Brian? The space patrol base and planet Neptune will be destroyed by another robot ship, loaded with high explosives. You wouldn't do that. The robot will appear to be an innocent supply ship, with you out of place, Commander. And the Neptune base destroyed. I'll have taken the first major step in my plan to rule the solar system. Goodbye, Commander. On we are. Man, he can't be serious. I'm afraid he is. Yeah, but what good would it do him to wipe out the Neptune thing? Baccarati's no ordinary criminal, Hap. Remember, Neptune is Baccarati's home planet. The one his family ruled for centuries. Yeah, until the people booted them out and joined the United Planet. And Baccarati's walked mine. Neptune is his personal property. His 
Destroying our spaceful installation there would delight his ego. Yeah, but it would make everybody in the United Planets so mad they'd insist on wiping out Baccarati's planet X. With his defenses, that's impossible at present. We have the people of ten planets full of helpless fear and panic. That's Baccarati's greatest weapon. Fear would force millions of people to surrender to save their lives in their homes. There's nothing we can do about it. Don't even move. Where are we now, Commander? I can't tell from here, but we should be well outside the planet X defense warning system. I think the paralyzer rays are going to wear off. I can move my fingers a little. We'll have to do better than that, Hap. Good defense squadron, Bell Space Patrol, to private cruiser MPC 307. That's the registry acknowledged. He's calling this ship? Major Robertson, commanding squadron 12. We have information that Prince Baccarati is aboard private cruiser MPC 307. Now on Paravector from Planet X. Oh, I could only get to that space of home. Keep working, Hap. Major Robertson to Baccarati. Acknowledge or we'll fire. Uh, any luck, Hap? Oh, no. <laughs> He's got to get loose. <laughs> He's firing at us. You place that missile across your nose to show we mean business, Baccarati. We know you're aboard because Commander Corey told us. You have ten seconds to surrender or the next missile will hit you amidship. I wish Major Robertson wouldn't be so conscientious just this once. If he hits us, he may never know he got us instead of Baccarati. Keep straining on those straps, Happy. Yes, sir. Five seconds, Baccarati. Five seconds, Happy. <coughs> Commander, you did it. No, Baccarati didn't cut off his transmitter. Major Robertson, hold your fire. You surrendering, Baccarati? Robbie, this is Commander Corey. Baccarati's not aboard. He's on planet X. Matt? Matt? Great Wolf, Centurion. I was about... Attention, all units. Stand by for further orders. Robbie, we've got to work fast. Order one of your ships to join airlocks with this robot. Yes, sir. After Happy and I are clear of this ship, destroy it. I want Baccarati to think his plan succeeded. Right, sir. When this ship is destroyed, return to your base. I'll take over the rest of your ship and proceed to the Neptune orbit. Hurry out. Meantime, back in the tower of his castle on planet X, Prince Baccarati turns to the guard, Orchid, and smirks with satisfaction. Did you see that orchid? Ha <laughs> ha! Did you see what happened to those instruments? I don't know much about this kind of thing, Your Highness. The remote controls and blue scope screen. The instruments rattled and returned to zero. That means the robot ship is destroyed. And with it, Commander Corey. And the Space Patrol got it. Yes, just as I planned. Now, let's see if I can see. This controls the other robot. Uh, when are you going to blow up the Neptune base with? Exactly. Watch the tiny dot on the screen. That's the ship approaching Neptune. In a few minutes, the Neptune base will be tight. I picked up something in the disco screen, please. A supply ship? I think so, sir. Uh, yeah, that's what it is, all right. Second course. Yes, sir. Got to be sure it's the right one. It's heading straight to the Neptune base, sir. From what direction? Hmm. He's facing it back. It came from 34 degrees off Pluto, which would indicate it came from planet X. An all regular ship is in order to avoid this sector. So well, that's the one we're after. It's on a collision course, sir. And it's keeping its acceleration. Stand by to fire cosmic missiles. Standing by, sir. Cut on automatic target selector. It's closing in on zero, sir. Number one missile fired, sir. Now, if Baccarati doesn't have any trick device to throw off our guided missile, we'll know in a couple of seconds. We've got it. Think what would have happened if that robot had hit Neptune. The base would have been wiped clear off the planet. As it is, I'll bet it'll rain fragments for a week. Fortunately, none of them will be big enough to do any damage. Boy, this is going to be a big disappointment to Prince Baccarati. Yes. Yeah. Just the way to get his mind off this setback. How, sir? We'll give him something new to worry about right away. A preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Hi, Space Patrollers, it's football time on the planet Terra. The Terra High Terrors versus the Jumpin' Jupiters. And today the Terrors are really running up the yardage. There they go, over the goal line again. Another touchdown for the Terrors. Yes, sir, they're supercharged all the way. They had their bite-sized checks today. Now, gang, how about you? 
If you want to be able to block and tackle and kick like a football hero, you have to get on the ball and stay on the ball every day. That means you need a power-packed, bite-sized check breakfast every morning. A big bowl full of rich, crisp, terrific-tasting rice checks or wheat checks. Those super cereals that help to supercharge you. Both have that modern bite-sized design for super easy eating. And both make swell between meal snacks. Because both taste just as good right out of the box. So space patrollers to run up lots of yardage on the gridiron to be the big star of your team, start right in tomorrow. Just have yourself a power breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks. No other cereal, flaked or plus, gives you so much nourishment in such concentrated bite-sized form. So power up for those space patrol cereals, rice checks, wheat checks. And now, a preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are at the Saturn City Spaceport, following a man they believe to be a cousin of Prince Baccarati. Vince all right, sir. In the back, he looks just like Baccarati. He's in the shadow of this fate-loading platform, Happy. Come on, let's close in. Just a minute, Benson. Yes? Step over here into the light. Anything to oblige, sorry. Commander, it's Prince Baccarati. Get him, Happy. All right, Malenko, use your ray gun. Look out, Happy. Look out, Commander. Oh, that does it, Malenko. Get them aboard the ship, and we'll give them a one-way trip to Planet X. Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story, The Spies from Planet X, when we check, rice check, and good hot Olsen again present Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol, created by Mike Moses, starring Ed Cameron as Commander Tory, and Ben Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Devery. <laughs> Other players were Bela Kovac, Norman Jolly, Ken Mayer, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. <laughs> now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Wilson again present... Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network.